in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Everyone present is pleased reminded to switch off their mobile phones. Apologies have been received from John Finney. Um, <clears throat> now, agenda item one for the committee is, uh, sorry, is the Clyde and the Hebrides Ferry Service. And we are going to take evidence from David McBain Limited on the ferry services in Scotland. I'd like to welcome Martin Dorchester, Chief Executive, and Robbie Drummond, the Group Finance Director for David McBrain Limited. I invite Mr. Drummond, if you'd like to make an opening statement, but I would ask you if it's, it's possible, please, to keep it as short as possible. Yeah, certainly. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so I'm, my name is Robbie Drummond, and I'm the Group Finance Director of David McBrain, and it's my colleague, Martin Dorchester, who's the Chief Executive. Um, we're very pleased to be here this morning to talk about the David McBrain Group and the contract to operate the Clyde and Hebrides ferry services. We were delighted to win the CHIFS contract and I would like to publicly thank our many supporters for the visible and positive support we received right across Scotland and in particular the cross-party support we received from MSPs and MPs including some of you who are here today. For those of you who are not aware the David Brain Group is a private company solely owned by Scottish ministers governed under the Companies Act with an independent board appointed by the Scottish Government. We are proud to be owned by the people of Scotland and we are aligned to the delivering the policies and objectives of the Scottish Government. We're also proud to be a living wage employer and in 2016 we were awarded the Scottish Living Wage Employer of the Year. We aim to recruit locally to support local sustainability and community success. Over the past, years, past few years we've undertaken a series of improvements including safety, new technology, and customer communications. Our success in offering a good and safe service has been validated externally with a series of national and international awards. We've also worked very well in partnership with our colleagues in Transport Scotland and communities to deliver significant changes to improve our services, including new routes, increased sailings, and indeed new vessels. Last year was an important one for the group. The key highlight, of course, being the award of the eight-year, £1 billion shifts contract, which started in October 2016. In addition, our expertise was similarly recognised by the Military of Defence, who awarded us a 35-year, £1 billion contract to operate Marchwood, the MOD's key strategic military port. And this contract supports our ambition to move into new markets using our skills, knowledge and experience, driving a much wider benefit for Scotland. I'd like to focus some brief comments on the CHIFS contract. There are three parties involved in managing the Clyde and Hebrides ferry service, services, each with their own set of responsibilities. Transport Scotland, who are responsible for procurement of the services, the service specification for routes and timetables, and also setting the fares and other policies, such as future vessel and infrastructure investment. The second party is CMAL, Caledonia Marine Asset Limited, who are wholly owned by the Scottish Government, but they are entirely separate from David McBrain. And they're responsible for procuring and owning the vessels, which are funded by the Scottish Government, leasing the vessels to the ferry operator, and owning and maintaining the 22 harbours. Dave McBrain, that's us, responsible for operating the public service contract, which we do through our subsidiary company, Calmac Ferries Limited. The contract stipulates that we lease the vessels from CMAL and that we pay harbour access dues to CMAL and other independent port operators. Our aim is to deliver a good service for our customers and to create long-term economic, uh, sustainable economic value for our communities and the Scottish Government. However, we do recognise that we operate an ageing fleet sailing into ageing port infrastructure um, and increasingly difficult weather conditions on the west coast of Scotland. Inevitably, this impacts our service, but we work very hard to minimise that disruption and to communicate changes to our passengers. Digital connectivity is also challenging across our network. We have invested in improved connectivity across our 80 sites which has been much more difficult than we originally anticipated. However, 
it will offer an improved service for all our customers, tourists and business, which will help support economic sustainability. We work really hard to retain the support and trust of our communities and key stakeholders, and we're therefore grateful for this opportunity to speak to you in that context. So thank you, and uh, Martin and I are happy to take any questions from the committee. Th thank you very much for that opening statement, and uh, I think Mari is going to be the first one to lead off with a question. Thank you, and thank you for coming to the committee today. Uh, you touched a bit about this in your opening statement, but it was really if you could provide a bit more detail to the committee on how the David McBrain group of companies is owned, managed, and financed. Sure, so the David McBrain group is, is, is a private company. Um, it is owned by Scottish ministers, um, and it is run as a private company, so we don't receive any direct grant and aid, um, and any any uh, we essentially go out to win public contracts um, and earn profits through generating those contracts. Is that? Uh, yeah, um, and the the finance. So just really you operate so, then. Yeah. So I, I think the you know we, we go out and bid and win contracts and yeah. we're paid to run those contracts. So uh, clearly the Clyde and Hebrides contract we're paid a level of subsidy to manage that contract. Um, likewise, with a contract down in uh, Marchwood, we're paid to run that contract. Uh, we don't receive any direct grant um, from the Scottish Government. Sorry. 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 At this stage, you, having mentioned Marchwood, which is obviously quite a uh, financially significant contract, you could, you could just explain what your involvement is there and, and, and a little bit about what's being done there. Yeah, certainly. I mean, the, the contract there is a, a long-term contract. Um, Marchwood is the military defence key military port where their uh, munitions and goods uh, go out from that port across the, across the world. And our role there is to manage that port, so to um, act as a, a subcontract to the MOD, managing that port and the operations. There's also a wider opportunity to commercially develop some of that site to bring in um, new services and operations into that port that would generate additional revenue for, for the group. And, yeah. sorry, yeah, yes, I, I, Martin. Just explain that. In a, uh, I, I thought it was great to ask my finance director to be brief, which was terrific, and I'm making note of that. <laughs> um, maybe to address two points. So, so one in terms of, of our structure and our ownership. If you think of us in terms of a, of a private company with shareholders, our shareholders are Scottish government, and we generate revenue by bidding and winning for contracts, which then gives us a mix of fair box revenue from, from customers and from retail and, and what we sell, as well as the amount of subsidy that is aligned to that contract. So, so that's how we generate our revenue. In, in terms of, of Marchwood, um, if I just slightly phrase it differently, uh, we bid as a joint venture to win a contract to deliver services in Marchwood but we won't, as it were, go and deliver the services. We set an organisation up there which we sit behind and we, they will procure from, from, from us the services that they need around things like finance and uh, marketing, etc., to deliver that. So, so we don't sit in there day to day and run that. We, we sit above it and they deliver that contract and we will get a fee that is for the services that we provide and then uh, when, that, when that business generates its margins at the end of the year then we would get a, 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 the, the premium from that. So does that help? And the premium from that, does that... Had, had, I'm just interested because it's obviously an important contract and, and uh, it, it could lead to other things, if the, in, indeed, if there were other ports established or hubs established elsewhere. So the, the premium that comes from that, um, does that come back and invested in, in the services that you're providing in Scotland uh, for the ferries, or does it go back to the, to the, to the shareholder? Uh, potentially, it could do both. Um, uh, we, we, have the, we, we have the same discussion that anyone would have with a shareholder that says we have made this level of profit this year. Within the CalMAC contract, there's a clawback facility that, that, that pulls that back in. Within the DML group, there would then be the opportunity for the DML group to say what do we want to do with our profits going forward and how would we invest them? And then as you'd expect, as we would talk to the shareholder about how we wanted to invest going forward. I understand, when did the contract start? Uh, so we took official uh, handover on December the 1st, 2016, and that's a 35-year concession, which um, 
the Scottish Government might want to consider on ferry services as well going forward. The REN will be December 2017. Or the, reporting actual, period. the actual operating year end will be that, but we will do it fiscal April to April. So at that stage, we can see how much money you're going to be investing back in, in, into the ferry service. Like yeah. Stuart, I think, has got a question for you. It, it was just a very small question. I know previously that uh, you ran an Irish ferry service for, I think, the Northern Ireland or Irish Republic. And really, I just wanted to ask the general question. It is therefore part of your business plans to opportunistically bid for, op for, for contracts out with Scotland uh, where it appears that that will complement what you're doing and enable you to make money? Yes, um, we, we, we actively look at what opportunities are out there and then we, we would do what all of the businesses do and look at what are the risks around that and, and do we believe that, that we can, um, you know, be, to be blunt, make money out of it. Um, uh, and, and therefore, we will go and do that. I've got a quick question on the back of that. Yeah. Do you operate any routes at a loss currently? <laughs> we, we, <laughs> I could get into what do we mean by loss or not. I mean, the, the reality is, is, is we run a fundamental lifeline service. So um, uh, in terms of if you did it discreetly, then, yeah, the routes run at a loss. But that's why you bid for the contract and get the subsidy plus the, the, the revenue to, to, to do that. It's so. probably worth clarifying all of our contracts, the CHIFS contract and indeed Gert Dunan contract that are run profitably. Yeah. Um, Raider, I think, sort of. Just a, just a quick question on the back of that. Will you be bidding for the Northern Isles ferry service? Yeah, absolutely will. Jamie, I think, sort of follow up, and then I want to come to the next question to Peter. I know we've got a lot to get through, so apologies, but I think that opening statement just sort of opened up a whole raft of uh, questions for us. But I just <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very informative. Um, uh, I think maybe for the benefit post this, it maybe a nice little flow chart of how the company's interlinked. I was quite interested in the the way that um, the, the you know the leasing of vessels and the, the relationship between the franchise and the it's all a bit confusing to an extent, but. Is there any, given that the, your shareholders are Scottish ministers of the Scottish government and the Scottish government are issuing tenders for new services of which you were successful in, in one and probably bidding in others in the future, have you ever come across any conflict of interest in the sense that it's absolutely in, in the interest of the government to give contracts to a company which it already owns as opposed to go out to the wider commercial market? And it's not a criticism, just an observation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I've heard companies before say, as it were, that you know you didn't win it, and, and I say, well, we did. Um, uh, there are uh, strict rules around the governance of, of the issue of contracts, and those contracts then get published for people to look at. Um, on a level playing field, we are very confident as a company that we don't get a free pass, that, that we win what we compete for. Um, and I think, uh, you know, yourselves and, and, and the scrutiny that is put under for civil service issuing contracts would, would say, you know, th there's, no free, there's no free pass on these. And we're very confident that we compete on a level playing field and we win on a level playing field. Thank you. Thank you for that. Peter, I think you've got the next question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and good morning, gents. Um, you, you've just won the, the new contract, which uh, kicked in on the 1st of October, and congratulations on that. One of the key things that you said during that bidding process was that you were going to in increase passenger and vehicle traffic by 10% and commercial traffic by over 12% over the period. Uh, I'm interested to see how you intend to do that, and, and if you don't manage to do that, what, what effect will that have on, on your finances and, and maybe the need for taxpayer support to, uh, to see you through. And I'll, I'll answer that. There's two key, two key ways we want to grow passenger growth. Um, the first one is, is working harder at how we work with local organizations and, and market our services. Um, so can we work with our, um, with our partners? Um, can we target our customers in a better way, in a more targeted way? So we are investing in, our, uh, in some technology that actually allows us to target customers better um, and perhaps offer, um, offer more interesting ways and routes to get onto, onto the islands and use the services that, that are there. So perhaps looking at some of the off-peak areas. So some really clever commercial targeted marketing, I think, will, will help, help with that. And working very closely with, uh, with Visit Scotland and local marketing organisations. 
The other thing we're doing is, is you know, capacity constraints is, is an issue for us, particularly in the summer. Uh, and we've got some initiatives to look at how we uh, make sure that the vessels are travelling with as much capacity or as full as, as we can. So we're looking at um, technically how we solve that. We're also looking at how we reduce the number of, of no-shows and make sure that people can actually get onto the boats and that will help, um, help increase that, that revenue. So we're quite confident over the period of, of the contract that we can grow revenue by, by 10%. Uh, and we've, we've committed to doing that. You, you talked about risk. If we, if we don't achieve that, then that's risk that sits, sits with us. This is a, a fixed price contract. Um, and if we don't achieve that, then that's um, a, an issue that we're going to have to deal with and manage. If you don't achieve that, the taxpayer isn't going to uh, end up with a, a bill at the end of the, the period. It's, it's well, you know, as, I, as I was saying, it's a, it's a fixed price contract. So the, the amount of subsidy that we receive over the eight years, that's the amount that we have to manage within. So if we're not generating the amount of fare box yeah. um, revenue, then we'll have to, have to address that. And the other thing worth pointing out is we also talked about increasing our onboard spend as well. So we've got initiatives to make that make that more more effective. So, having a better service for customers, both in our food and our retail offerings, so making that more attractive, um, which will again help with that help with that objective. But deficits in in companies fall to the shareholders, surely. Where we're coming from, we have to cut our cloth. If we don't if we don't hit our revenue targets, then we have to cut our cloth. That's that's how. We as a business, and as, as, as Robbie said, it's a fixed price contract. Um, there's no get out of jail card for us. So there's no more money, it would just be a reduction in services. Is, 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 is that no, what no, what I'm saying is we would have to find other ways of managing that. So, you know, if, if you think about it in terms of almost a layering effect, so we have a minimum level of service that is specified because we, we run a lifeline service, so that will not diminish. Built above that, we have put revenue projections in about things that we could do. We will have put money versus those revenue projections about what would we invest in, in marketing to drive that sales. If that is not happening, then we have to start cutting our cloth without diminishing the service. Do you want to follow up on that or do you want to ask an a tiny, I just heard 10% revenue increase. My notes say traffic increase and I just wanted to be clear which it was. It's revenue. That's fine. Thank you. Stuart, do you want, it, yours I'll is go on to my question, question, if that yes, suits please, you. Yeah. Um, and this can be dealt with very briefly, by the way. I just wanted to <laughs> ask... Well, You're managing I'm, us very well. I'm a techie. No, I'm a techie, so mm -hmm. there's a danger. I just wanted to ask about smart cards, uh, which you're introducing, and what you think the benefits are. And in particular, uh, as my wallet is increasingly with smart cards, and there's two of my ITSO, ITSO smart cards, which is the UK uh, government standard that basically everybody uses, I just want to be clear that you are seeking to make sure your smart card service isn't exclusively available on a smart card that's got Colmac on it, that it can actually be... Because I think people really, if they're going to go smart ticketing, want to have one piece of plastic that they're able to use it. It's an issue for others, but where do you stand? Yes, yeah, so um, any technology we introduce, it's been introduced for the benefit of, of customers. And I think um, you know, smart and integrated ticketing um, will, will drive real benefits for, for customers. But you can be sure that any, any technology we use will be integrated with, with other transport operators, so including rail and, and bus operators. So those cars will be interchangeable. And I think it's, it's, it's wrong just to look at cars, because actually... The next technologies are looking at um, you know, using mobile phones, using um, uh, credit cards, and you know, that technology is also coming down there. So we'll be clever about the way we introduce that. We are, um, we're clearly talking to uh, our other partners in the transport industry and, of course, Transport Scotland to make sure that we uh, have the right solution. So when a customer buys a through ticket that covers the cost of ferry and rail, mm. they will, for example, simply be able to use the smart rail cut. That will be the intention, yeah. Thank you, Kim Thank you. Richard, I think you're the next question. Good morning, gentlemen. Um, when companies win contracts, they make quite a lot of promises in order sometimes to win the contract. Uh, and amongst providing uh, creation of a, a directive community, retaining your head office in Guruk, all existing routes and services continue to operate as before. 
but you also made the one fundamental promise that you had plans to increase local employment and also opportunities, especially the creation of more apprenticeship opportunities. Where would you do that and how would you do that? Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, one of the things that we, we, we perhaps have a benefit in, in our shareholder is, is we, we can choose within those envelopes where we spend our money. So, um, what I mean by that is, therefore, I wouldn't necessarily have to go for the cheapest deal for something. If it's in my envelope, then I can spend it locally. And, and so we do that. Um, we have committed to supporting uh, local businesses, so some 60 plus percent now of our food that we sell on board comes from local suppliers. So that that allows them, um, as we can go now and give them three, five, eight year contracts, that allows them to get through that hard period as, as, as organisations do of, of, of survival. So, so we do that. We uh, advertise locally and therefore recruit first first cut from, our, from, from local businesses. We, uh, because of the way we're structured, we, we don't go and give money as it were, but what we can, what we can and we do do now is, is we support local businesses with longer term contracts uh, or we support them with employment by, so we, we, we run a program uh, along with HI and along with uh, uh, other organisations called Vital Spark that, that operates out of uh, Danoon, Rothsey and Campbelltown to generate startup businesses and the benefit, as I said, again, that we then bring is we can go in there and say, if you've got a startup business and it's a good idea, we'll give you a three year contract and, and it gets them through there. So, so we do that. As apprentices, we, uh, it, it's sad and it's good in a way, but um, uh, Calmac is, is the largest uh, uh, employer of apprentices in, in maritime shipping, and we, we do 30 a year. So when you think of the size of the maritime industry, and we're, 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 the, we're the largest player, as it were, in that, um, that, that that's a big challenge. Um, off the back of that, our challenge becomes then, I don't think people realise this, so, so we take on an apprentice, and we put them through their training, and then they have to go and get employed somewhere else to get their deep sea training. So we sort of keep our fingers crossed that the investment we've put up front, we get back further down the line. But, but we've baked those commitments in as, as KPIs and measures for us as a business that will do that. So every year we will do that, and then we will seek to grow it. And I think as well as that, if you look over the last five years, um, we have consistently grown our business um, and, and at the same time we have therefore grown the number of people that we recruit into our business. So um, it, it's that relentless focus on doing it. So, so that's one of, you know, I, I understand what you mean in terms of when people make commitments, that, that's one of the commitments I think we are probably more comfortable on delivering against um, and, and that's a great benefit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. We're going to move on now to, a, I think, a more specific area, and, J and Jamie's going to lead on that, I think. Um, so I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the Gurk to Danoon ferry service contract, uh, which is quite relevant uh, uh, in my region, um, and I'm sure some other members will come in uh, off the back of some of my questions. But um, in, in light of uh, the sort of lack of <clears throat> any information from uh, the uh, Transport Minister on where we're at with this, I, I wondered if maybe you could shed some further light. I uh, could ask very specifically if um, our Gull Ferries uh, has submitted a bid, and we know there are four unnamed um, shortlist uh, for that service, and then I'll, I'll ask some more specifics about the route and, and the nature of the, the contract. Yeah, so on, just on your specifics, have we submitted a bid? I think that's what we did is we entered into the initial process, which was to qualify uh, through the PQQ stage for the next round. So we submitted a bid under the name of Carmack Ferries Limited into that process. So, so perhaps, is everyone clear of, of as it were, how the bid process works? I think you could, you could uh, explain it, but again, if, I, if, if you could do it, or, or Robbie, as, uh, uh, as, okay. as, as briefly as possible. So, so the bid process usually works with, um, you have an initial stage, um, it's got called the different names, but usually a, a pre-qualification stage, which is when you take a, you know, a whole range of people that want to bid into a contract and you bring that down to a, a short list. So that's the stage that we've been through, uh, pre-qualification. So, uh, and we, we bid for that under the name of, of Carmack Ferries Limited. The next stage would be then for the uh, tenderer, 
uh, in this case Transport Scotland, to issue what's called uh, an invitation to tender, an ITT. And it's on the back of that invitation to tender that the uh, procurer will be inviting bids um, and the, 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 the shortlist of parties will then have a period to submit their bids into the process and that might be anything from you know, one month to, to three months depending on the size of the, of the contract. Okay, that's helpful, so Jeremy, continue. One of the peculiarities of this specific contract is obviously there's a passenger service but also a, um, a vehicle element to it. Um, and in, in, in the briefing notes it says that, um, that the bidders obviously are putting in a tender for the passenger service but are being encouraged to provide an unsubsidised vehicle carrying service. And I think that's quite a loose term. So I wondered if you had any comments on the, the notion of the, the relationship between the, the, the subsidised passenger service and the viability of a, uh, of a commercially viable um, vehicle carrying service. Because I've had representation from both sides of the river from various community groups who are concerned about the nature of who will be awarded the contract and whether there will still be uh, a vehicle service given that it's not able to be subsidised under state aid rules. Uh, so I wondered if you had any comments or views on that. So, so as of today, it is only a passenger service, so we're talking about the, the Gurut to Danoon service. Clearly you've got the service down the road, which is a, um, a vehicle service. So the current Gurut to Danoon is, is passenger only. Um, my understanding is that the, uh, the invitation to tender, and again, we haven't seen that, so it's difficult to comment, but they, uh, we open then for bidders to either bid on a passenger only or passenger and, and vehicle. And the decisions that, that any bidder will have to go through is saying the passenger bit will be subsidised, so you know, we can be paid for running the passenger bit, but the vehicle service will have to stand at its own two feet and be profitable, so it, it cannot be subsidised or cross-subsidised. So the thought process that anyone has to go through is can we put on a vehicle service and make that run profitably when there's a very competent um, operation down the road that is already running vehicle services. So it's, it's difficult to comment more until we see the shape of the invitation to tender. So just to confirm for the record, you've submitted a bid for the passenger only element and you're yet to establish whether you submit a vehicle no, to element. We'll just come back to our saying we, we haven't submitted a bid yet. What we've done is, all we have done is, is pre-qualify. Okay. And remember to, to pre-qualify, what a bidder demonstrates is that it is, it's financially sound, um, that it has, has competence and, and capability. And it's on that basis that the, the procuring body then selects, in this case, four individuals or four companies that it thinks is best placed to offer the service. So we haven't done any more than pre-qualify. Okay. Um, I think my, one of my colleagues wants to ask about the specifics of the, the prerequisites of the, the tender. So. Are you sure? It, yes, it's very brief then. It, it's basically just on the, the prerequisite for half hourly services at certain um, peak times and also the, um, the, the minimum 40 metre long vessels on that route uh, for, you know, to make it a robust service. Um, again, you haven't submitted a bid. I'm more understanding of the situation. How, uh, what are your views on those two parameters that are in, in the uh, initial... Um, you know, coming up in the, the tender process. So, do you, do you have any thoughts on, on whether that's achievable or doable? Yeah, so it's, yeah. Any, anything's achievable or doable. Um, it's how much are you prepared to pay for that? Um, you know, a 40 metre boat, uh, you know, I currently run a 67 metre boat back and forth there today. Um, I think if, if where you're going, I'm just for real clarity of that. There is no bid yet because there's nothing to bid against. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, once we see the shape of that, we will look and make a, a, a decision. But you know, when you start talking about a 40 metre boat, you, you're walking into sort of 30 million pound procurement cost for, for a 40 metre boat. It's a big cost. Um, and I think that's worth noting. But in terms of, of you know, if, if we see an invitation to tender that says provide a 40 metre boat and provide a half hourly service, then we will calculate how much does that cost and that's how we would put a bid together. Okay. Jo John, do you want to... If uh, Jamie's finished, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm a Glasgow MSP and I use the ferries occasionally, but not, I'm not that familiar with them. And it just puzzles me, and I think would puzzle my constituents, why we have a standalone commercially viable, apparently, ferry service roughly between Guruk and Danoon, and we're even thinking about subsidising another one, because in the bus services in Glasgow, for example, if there's a commercial route, we cannot have a competing 
subsidised route. You, you want me to say on that, John? Yeah. Sorry? I, I run a business, and, and if someone puts a contract there, then, then I, I will bid for it. Um, the, the decision as to whether that, that is done is, is not, that's, that's not ours to make. No, I accept it's a kind of policy question, yes. I, I suppose my question is, and maybe you can't answer this either, but you know, if I've got a pot of money here for a subsidy, you know, is the first, should the first on the list be another, a second ferry, effectively, Guruk Danun? Or, I mean, are there some specifics can you explain to me about this service? I mean, is yours more town centre to town centre and links to the railway better than the other one? Is that, is that yeah, part uh, of the issue? Yeah. Uh, um, I'll, I'll be brief. Yeah. Yes. So, so Guruk Danun, the passenger owner ferry, is a railhead into Guruk, then onto Danun, and is, is, is therefore town centre to town centre. Uh, if you go down to Western Ferries, then uh, it, it's link span to link span. So, therefore, it's, it's predominantly geared to uh, uh, driving traffic. So, so, so yes, that, that, that's how it's set up. Yeah. So, Guruk Danun is, is potentially set up as a railhead into a, well, not potentially, it is a railhead into a ferry into a town centre. So, so, that's how it's set up. Figures the passenger numbers compare at the moment between the two routes? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know Western ferries because they, they predominantly drive it's vehicle, vehicle traffic. Vehicles, whereas right? that we're carrying 300, 350,000 a year on foot traffic. Okay. Thank you, I, I, Martin. Thank you for answering that. And um, I, I think we all very much take the point that it, it, it's a question we'll have to raise with the minister mm -hmm. when the opportunity arises. Now, uh, I think. <laughs> uh, I think Stuart's got a question. Then Rhoda's got a question on the back of it. It's a question that may be seen to be rhetorical. Um, given that the cent town centre to town centre sailing is about 50% longer than the link span to link span sailing that's operated by uh, you, the commercial operator, um, is it not fundamentally difficult to make uh, a vehicle service uh, commercially viable when the sailing, which is where a lot of the costs are going to come, is 50% uh, higher without particularly obvious uh, uh, benefits. Because when there used to be two vehicle sailings, the commercial operator got something like 85% of the traffic anyway. Isn't it always going to be a very, very big commercial ask to make a vehicle service work centre to centre? I think it's a fair, it's a fair comment. And I, and I referred to earlier when the ITT comes out, we'll have to make an assessment as to, first of all, we're bidding for the passenger element, and if we wanted to bid for the vehicle element, what are the commercial parameters around that, and how would you make that work from a you know, standing start of zero traffic? It should be hard. Thank you for your short answer to the short question from Stuart. <laughs> Rhoda, um, <laughs> you would like to go. I, constituents in Dunoon tell me what they want is town centre to town centre. What they want is a reliable service and a comfortable service. And I think that's one of the issues that's been ongoing. It's not altogether reliable. And even when it can sail, at, on many points, it's not very comfortable and doesn't feel particularly safe. And I think that's why some of those things we've been talking about may end up in a, a tender document. Would there be a better way of ensuring reliability and comfort other than saying, you know, a 40 metre long boat or, you know, it needs to carry cars as well, which obviously makes it a, a bigger boat if it can carry cars. But um, is there a, another way to address the concerns that maybe would be more cost effective? Um, I'm not, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure there is. I, I think, I think, you know, and I'll share, Jenny, if we're brutally honest, I think, you know, we would never run an unsafe service. We absolutely would never run an unsafe service. Um, and I think the reality is that, that, you know, we're running two small boats on the Clyde and, and there's some challenging weather on, on the Clyde. Um, uh, the reality is also, and perhaps addressing slightly Stuart's point as well, um, there are speed restrictions on the Clyde. So it, 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 that, that, that itself is, an, is a challenge. Um, unless, as it were, you get a big, heavy boat, which really, you know, the substantive increase in cost to move from, you know, something like the Alley Cat or the Fly, which we have on there, which you would be looking in the market between sort of five, perhaps, and eight million, 
to a 40 meter plus boat, you know, you're walking into 25 to 30 mil. It's a substantive step up. Um, so I think there are things we can do around the timetable that, that we would do. There are things that we do ongoing around uh, uh, better managing the service, w which we do. Um, there are things that we are, we are working on um, in terms of improving the facilities on, on the vessels that, that, that we do. Um, you know, I think we, we, with the best will in the world, um, we would bid better this time than we did perhaps last time, and we would put f improvements in that that we we perhaps should have or maybe should have done six years ago. So I think I think I think there is some room for improvement, but I think some of it's around the margins. And if you want to have a really significant improvement, it will be significantly the, the cost will be significant. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. The, ne the next question is on a slightly different subject. Gail, um, if you'd like to lead Thanks, on. Thanks, convener. Good morning. Hello again. Um, I want to um, touch on the Scottish Ferry Services Plan, which runs from 2013 to 2022, and uh, two parts. So the first part is specifically about the Clyde and Hebrides Ferry Services contract, in which sets out a number of long-term developments, um, additional sailings, continuation of improved winter services, etc., etc. I wondered if you could provide a progress update on the delivery of these requirements under the plan, please. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, in, in terms of, of uh, ongoing improvements, um, uh, we have met a number of those around uh, the, the service that we run into Barra, uh, the services that we run into Auburn Craig Newer, um, and uh, Collinsey, uh, and uh, the, the, the things that uh, we, we, we are doing now and are an iterative part of that. Um, those timetable enhancements have been in part delivered, so we're part of the way through that. Um, the, the, the way we're deploying the vessels is in line with that. And as uh, the new tonnage comes on in the next three to five years, um, sorry, the next two to five years, as it were, will allow us to then further develop that. So, um, so in terms of, of, of progress, we're on track. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, it also outlines a schedule of harbour works, Weems Bay, Tarbert and Gurok, and proposes replacing vessels, four of them by 2019 and six of them by 2025. Um, how are you getting on with that? We're on track. So uh, gurek has been, uh, uh, I'd say, 99 per cent done, uh, as it were, because um, there's always lots of bits of snagging that, that you end up with. Uh, Weems Bay uh, has been done and completed, um, and I'd encourage anyone who's not been there, given RETs in there, uh, it's commutable from Glasgow. Uh, so Weems Bay has been done, um, uh, and we are on, on track, um, uh, as we'd hope to be. What yeah. feedback from the public? Um, we get mixed feedback, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, it, it's always different. I mean, one of, one of the fundamentals, you know, we deliver a lifeline service, and for those communities that, that only have, as it were, the ferry, the moment I start closing uh, infrastructure down, it, it creates challenges for them. So uh, I think we managed Gurek and Weems Bay very, very well. But, you know, if you, I don't know if anyone's been to our offices in Gurek, but from my office, you can see when, when one of the bigger boats comes in, because we usually run the small boats out of Gurek. When we closed Weems Bay and we were bringing people uh, from, from Butte to, to, to Gurek with the best will in the world, you know, it's tough to walk up and down the gangplank with your shopping. Yeah, and, and we helped as much as we could and you know the lift got out. so um, if you talk to them now what you get is very positive feedback the interface has improved still bits better that we could do but the interface has improved um, the, uh, the the work uh, was done to time which is, is a benefit um, but there is still more to do so so it's pretty good I think is, is where I would say okay thanks Okay, uh, Raidra, I think you've got the next question. Yes, um, can I ask about the Lord of the Isles? Um, given that it had a period of in dry dock, and then there was a, a thinning of the structure discovered, and it's away again. Um, time frames, and I guess how was this not discovered when it was in for maintenance? And then my understanding, it was discovered before Christmas, but it ran until after the Christmas period. 
so there's kind of a, a bit of a say, you know, how, how crucial are those repairs if it was still able to run? Um, wish I'd got my technical director with me now. So <laughs> <laughs> the, the reality, so if I, if I take some of the, 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 the spots that people measured, so if you, has anyone been on the Lord of the Isles? Or been on one of our, I don't know, New Hestia? I think you have. So 5,000 ton of metal, and the damage was about that big. So in, in terms of, and, and by that I mean that sort of scale. Um, so in, in, in terms of, of um, uh, the severity of it, uh, it had to be done, but it, it wasn't as it were, you know, it's like you could drive to the garage with a crack in your windscreen, yeah, but you wouldn't carry on doing the service. So, so there was that element to it. In terms of... Um, uh, when vessels go into dry dock, um, uh, they go in with a, a, a large work schedule of what we do, and we, we, we monitor the work schedule. They come out of that, and, and, and the challenge around it is, Lord of the Isles is a 30-plus-year-old vessel. It's gone through major surgery when it goes into dry dock, because it is deep in, in invasive work. Um, uh, and when it came out, we then found that there were some more latent issues with it that we needed to look at. Um, so it's back in now, and it should be back out. Hang on, sorry, it should be back out the next week. Is is, is my understanding from yesterday. So, um, so, so there is, there is, you you can run with a fault, yeah, and you manage the fault, yeah, um, because it takes quite a while for our ships to go in and get docked, and going to your point, you know, I, I could put something in that's a minor piece of work that actually ties the vessel up for a, for a week, because it's got to go down to a yard or up to a yard to have a minor piece of work done. Um, but a minor piece of work on one of our vessels is, is quite a major piece of work, and, and therefore something like that you couldn't do while it sat in, sat in the port, so it had to go off. Is that... I think I've, I've, that, I make a long so answer wrong there. Don't you? And, and yeah. it is due to be replaced... By 2025, is that? I, I think that would be a very good thing. Um. <laughs> You're not giving a commitment. <laughs> <laughs> that was a nice try and, and a good dodge from Martin. Um, <laughs> so Gail, do you, want to, do you want to follow up on? Yeah, just yeah. Yeah. the Malig to Loch Boy Steel Service, which is. Again, in the winter timetable is not maybe as often as people would want, and there are issues about reliability. And where do, um, I visited the Malig Harbour, and they were unaware of any issues with the harbour, so I'm not quite sure where the reliability issues come from. Um, I think Malig and Loch Boysdale are the two most difficult ports to take a vessel into. And I would say to anyone, if you want to understand getting the Lord of the Isles into Malig, yeah, it is one of the most difficult things to do. Yeah? And I think there has to be a reality about when, when they say that. Um, if you imagine trying to do a handbrake turn with a 90-metre vessel weighing 5,000 tonnes and, and sort of handbrake turn it, that's not far short of what we do in, in Malig. So, so in terms of, of reliability in the winter, that is by far the two most difficult Ports, and the fact that you're going in and out of those two is a real, real mariner's challenge. I think the second thing, and perhaps in, in terms of for us as a company, and one of the things we need to be stronger going forward, and I'm going to generalise this slightly, Rhoda, and I think you'll know the issues. We spend an awful lot of money on berthing fees for people to keep updating their harbours for us so that we can make decisions for masters coming in based on very recent knowledge. Yeah? And so one of the challenges that we face is, you know, over a long time, we've got older ports and older infrastructure, and we've perhaps not had everyone being on top of their ports as we need them to be, and we need to be. So in terms of where we're getting to with Lock Boys Down Manage, now we've got a summer service, yeah, that gives masters more confidence and learning of going in and out of those ports. So I believe the winter service will now start to improve because there's a confidence piece of they've gone into it so many times. The second piece for that is we're getting much better at making sure uh, ports in our harbours that we go into are getting dredged and repaired properly so that the masters, again, can be confident when they go in that they're not going to scrape the bottom. And I think 
perhaps a bit maybe worthwhile sharing for, 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 for when you get challenged for anyone across, a, across the network. You know, we operate on one meter clearance going into um, some of our ports and harbors. So the bottom is that far, as it were, off the boat. Uh, we, we come close, as it were, definitely to grinding on a regular basis. So if that swell of the sea, because most people think it's the wind that creates the problem for us, it's not just the wind, it's the sea swell and the sea state. Because when we go in, we've got so little clearance across the bottom of the boat. So there's a mixture of, there's a mixture of things that we're doing that I think will improve for, Mar for, for Maliglock Boysdale over the next few years. And one of the biggest things is the fact we are doing the summer service now that then helps us for the winter service because we're getting better, better understanding of it. Listening to people's wishes and aspirations for more ferries in the winter as well. I always listen to them. Whether we can afford them, I think, is, is a challenge for us. Um, and then the second thing, I think, perhaps going to a, a challenge that was made earlier, you know, we run somewhere in the region of 5,000 empty sailings. Yeah? And part of the reason is that is in the winter time, yeah, w the capacity you know, in our vessels is colossal. Yeah? So over a full year, we, we probably run about 30% capacity over a full year. Yeah? It's almost like saying on the M25, it's not that busy at two o'clock in the morning, and it's not. But in the winter, our vessels run, very rarely run full, very rarely run half full. So it's how we best manage that level of capacity. So where we can, we, we will, and we've done that pretty frequently. Just a, a final question on the Malig Armadale on the Karusk. I mean, obviously that was a boat built for that run, um, and we see more boats being built, especially for um, journeys, so that they fit with harbours, they fit with the, the requirement. Um, it has been moved, um, and as you can imagine, the people in Malig and Skye are really unhappy about that. Um, last summer, a lot of businesses lost money just because things like buses couldn't get across to Skye, and given that it's probably the last place where you could take a bus over the sea to Skye, which is kind of what tourists want to do. It seems a bit perverse to be taking that off when it was built for that. And, you know, when we get promised boats for routes, if they're going to be moved off to somewhere else, that's really not going to improve the service. So what comfort can you give to the folk in Sky and Malig that they're going to get their boat back? Uh, I can't give them comfort that they're going to get their boat back. I've, I've been pretty clear. Um, we, we're putting uh, a two-boat service on Malig Armadale this year, which is the Loch Fine and the Lord of the Isles. Um, I could go into a whole raft of, of, of discussion around it, but, but what I would say is um, we, we have put substantive uh, support into, into that route now in terms of, of uh, marketing, in terms of, of commercialism, in terms of, of help. Um, the route was up year on year, so I think, I think there's some real challenges around um, uh, how we market that going forward. But we have a limited number of vessels to deliver a limited number of services and, and we, we, we have to manage the network as, as best we can. We are committed to supporting Malig Armadale. Uh, we're meeting with them regularly and we're talking to them about some of the issues. I think what I would say from, from, from here, Rhoda, is Sky is a great tourist destination. I think we have put a, a robust service in there for this year. We need people to get behind that service and, and, and support it as, as best they can, and we will support them as, as, as best we can. Um, but we have, we have put the best service we can on that route currently. Just to interrupt, I, I, Martin, I, I, I'm very grateful for your very full answer. <laughs> and because Sky's an area which I have an interest in, I perhaps let you go longer than I should have done. Okay. We are quite tight for time, so I would urge everyone to keep the questions and the answers, if I may, as short as possible. Okay. Gail has got a follow-up, and we've got about four questions and a, and a very limited time scale. So, um, Just quickly, and if you can't answer it just now, I would appreciate written um, answer to the committee. Um, uh, again, on the back of the um, route that Rhoda was talking about, you operated a single vessel in 2015, three vessels in 2016, and a two vessel in 2017. What's the difference in operating costs in those three years? I'd have, 
I'd have to come back to you on, on that. I would appreciate yeah. if you Very could. Happy for Thank you. An answer to the, to the committee on that. Um, John, if I may. Sorry. Right, uh, I'm going to combine two questions here, but uh, the, the whole question of coordinating your timetables with uh, either rail or bus, I mean, I think well, Ardrossan and Largs would be rail and somewhere like Kenna Craig would be bus. Uh, how does that work? And are there penalties for either side if you kind of miss each other? Um, so we work very hard in trying to make sure we are coordinated and we spend a lot of time working with, with communities and trying to match up the rail and bus timelines with our, with our services. Um, but clearly that's not always, not always possible, but we try as hard as we can do. Um, one of the communities and then expect the trains to fit in or vice versa, or is it not as simple as that? I would say it's not as simple as that. <laughs> but, okay, right, you don't need to go into all the detail. Yeah, we, 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 like it to be that simple. we We clearly can't demand that rail you know, matches our services, so it's a, it's a, it's a discussion and negotiation with, with other transport operators and involving the communities. One of the commitments we have made in, in, in our bid is to appoint a full-time um, transport integration manager. Uh, and their full-time role will be to, to work with the other transport operators and communities to try and make sure that's as, as best connected as it, as it can be. The train's late and you wait for it. Is there a penalty for you? Potentially. Right. Yeah, it depends how late and how, and late how long. Is. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the way the way our contract works is, is um, we are penalised for where we fail to meet reliability targets. We don't sail. We're also penalised for punctuality. Right. So depending on which route, um, the shorter routes, it starts from five minutes, and the longer routes, it goes up to, I think, 20 minutes. So there is a penalty regime if we sail late, and that clearly has an impact if we're, uh, if we're waiting. It also has an impact on the passengers, so it's not as easy to say just wait for the train because um, there may be other passengers impacted with further on, on ongoing transport connections. Okay, so that's, okay. That, that's great, that's fine. Um, and the other area I wanted to touch on was disability. Um, I mean, clearly you're running quite big ferries and quite small ferries. I mean, I was over on Muck and Egg uh, not so long ago, and, you know, the, 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 it's great, and the, and the boat goes in, but, the, you know, the wave still comes across and you kind of jump to avoid the water. But obviously, if you're in a wheelchair, you can't really do that. I, I mean, where are we going with disabilities? Can, is there a kind of limit to it in the smaller islands that you just can't go very much further? Um, yes and no, I suppose, is the answer. Um, so, so we work very closely with, with different organisations to improve it, but, but the reality is, is they're 35-year-old pieces of kit and they were built different times, so we, we incorporate it into new build when we can. I think the other thing that we, we, we find locally, um, islands, and if you've been on Muckinag, locally islands and communities find their own way to, to deliver some of that, and, and we work closely with them. Um, in terms of, of, some of, of some of the islands that we go to and the nature of the infrastructure, it will be very difficult to change it. It's probably worth adding that um, in, in our bid, we have made a commitment to spending significant amounts of money on improving um, those facilities and the vessels and the ports. And we're running equality impact assessments to try and see what we can do uh, at a reasonable cost. So it's something... Bigger boats in the bigger harbours, yes. isn't it? It's the smaller boats and the smaller That's absolutely right. ports that are more so difficult. We're running, we're, so we're running these impact assessments. We're committed to spending some money. So we're going to try and do what we can do. Right. Okay. Thanks, Chair. Can I just say that actually it'd be quite useful to have an update on that when, 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 when you've come to your decision because I think the whole aspect of, of, of access is important. Yeah. Richard Lyle's got the next question. Uh, thank you. Um, it's an experience to be on a ferry. At the end of the day, I, I, all the places at Road and John have mentioned, I would love to go, and uh, it, it's, you see the, the films and um, going down, down the water, as people used to say. How do you um, take the views, all the passengers you've got, how do you take their views and freight passengers, customers, and how do you uh, report on the actions of what people are saying? Because I think it's a, a wonderful experience and a... I promised myself when I retire, I'm going to go around Scotland and go to all these wonderful places on your ferries. So how would you say to me as a customer, you know, or say to customers, how are you going to improve the service? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so we do what you'd expect all transport operators to do. So we run surveys, we run focus groups, and we, we, we capture those experiences. Um, I think for any, uh, anyone here who represents anywhere across the West Coast will know our customers are not shy in coming forward and, and see it quite familial. 
So, so we get a lot of a lot of feedback just locally anyway that, that, that people send in to us. Um, we, we capture that, uh, we turn it back out, and we, we push that out to people as well. We we attend regular ferry user groups, and therefore we take feedback. It's not always just about timetables, etc., but it's about you know the experience and what can you do to improve it. And we do standard benchmarking against other operators as again. Uh, and, and when we say about other operators, not just other ferry operators. We look at you know who's good and who's who's the best in what they do. So do we go and look at you know what Virgin Atlantic are doing in planes and things like that? And so we, we, we capture that. So we do you know all the bog standard things, surveys, user groups, focus groups, um, and we have much more community act activity and engagement than I think most other organisations do. Um, uh, I think perhaps going back to a point Ronnie was making, good and bad in terms of the, the wish list that people hit us with, but we, we, we encounter that a great deal. If you're part of the community and you like to blend in with the community. Where we can. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So. Thank you. That, that concludes the, uh, the questions that we had for you. In fact, there were a few more. Um, but before I address those, if I may, I'd, Martin or, or Robbie, I don't know if you'd like to give a, a very brief closing statement, if there's anything that we've missed that you'd like to bring to our attention. Um, I think, one, thank you for uh, being so gentle with us. Um, we appreciate that. Uh, two, just going to a point on timetables. There is a nuance for us in timetables. Don't forget that, that it's called the tide. So one of our challenges comes if we hang about too long, we're not going to get out the harbour, which becomes a really interesting debate with the train people. Um, th third bit for me was just in terms of some of the things that you've asked us for, will, will someone from the committees that were trigger it to us or would, do you want us to just take it away and we'll feed it in? I, I can absolutely clear that or clarify that the clerks will write to you with a list of questions that we're expecting answers from yeah. and and if the, there'll be one or two questions that we've missed today just because of the timing yeah. that we may add on to it so yeah. the, the, Wait, the fourth thing could I just say and, and it's an open invitation um, I have found in, in five years of running Calmac ferries um, it, it's a simple but complex business um, Please feel, don't be afraid, as it were, to, to phone and ask us. And, and you know, we, we are quite happy to share uh, what we do and the information. And if it helps to generate a better understanding of it, w you know, we, we're pretty, he's more open than me, but we're a pretty open organisation. So please, please feel free to do that. Can I, can I thank you both for coming? And, and the committee will be engaging with, with you further, further during this session as, as we become clearer on, on things that the government are doing. And I also thank you for the invitation to, to spend time with you. I think some committee members may slightly be worried that they, that about some of the handbrake turns and, and the small clearances <laughs> that you've got. And we may avoid those particular routes, but we would very much like to engage with you. And thank you very much for the evidence that you've given us this morning. So thank you. I'm gonna suspend the meeting now while we give the chance for the witnesses to change.
Jesus. The second item on the agenda is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy and Connectivity on the Agricultural Policy Payments. This session is really to allow the Cabinet Secretary to update the committee following the evidence that he gave us in September 2016. The Cabinet Secretary is joined by Eleanor Mitchell, Director of Agriculture and Rural Communities, Eddie Turnbull, Head of Agriculture and Rural Communities Information Systems, and Annabel Turpey, there we go, Chief Operating Official for the Rural Payments at the Scottish Government. I welcome you all to the meeting. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make an opening statement? And if I may, before I ask you to do that, just remind you we are very short of time because there are a lot of questions on a very important subject. So I, I would urge everyone uh, to be as brief as possible. But Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Uh, well, thank you. Good morning. Uh, to yourself and, and everyone, and thank you for inviting me to the committee today to update you on CAP and also on the extremely important uh, fishing negotiations and their outcome. Putting the 2015 CAP payments on a stronger footing and ensuring smoother delivery from the rural payments and services online payment system have been, as members know, my key priorities, and they remain so. Uh, and uh, that has been the case since inception of my role as Cabinet Secretary. And as you know, Convener, we are making strenuous efforts to put the CAP Futures Programme and the 16 payments onto a better footing. That was what I promised I would do at the outset, and that is what we, we are doing. That has included reviewing staffing and team requirements, and we've put in place a new governance staffing, and I'm pleased, therefore, to introduce the leaders of that new or nearly new team today. Uh, and they are Eleanor Mitchell, the Director of Agriculture Division, who's the Senior Responsible Owner of the SRO for the Futures Programme, Annabel Turpe, who's the Chief Operating Officer for Rural Payments, and she leads on making sure that the payments are being made and that we have systems and processes in place so to do, as well as ensuring CAP compliance. Uh, and Eddie Tumble, who is the Head of Information Services Division responsible for the provision of IT services to the Directorate. His role in the CAP Futures Programme is to make sure that we get the IT programme that we need to deliver the CAP payments. Convener, we've made a great deal of progress with the 15 payments since my last statement to Parliament in September. You have received a copy of the Director General Economy's uh, letter to the Public Aud Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee, which provides a summary of recent progress. Since the 8th of December, an additional 1,658 payments have been made to customers, an increase in the total number of payments from 38,340 uh, to 39,998. The value of payments made across Pillar 1 and Pillar 2 schemes has risen from 448 million to 455 million. For our basic payments, greening and young farmers schemes, the largest element of CAP funding, 99.7% of estimated eligible claimants have now been paid, with payments totaling £343 million. For beef and sheep schemes, which make up the remaining element of our Pillar 1 funding, we have paid 99% of eligible claimants with a value of £36 million. Creating a dedicated payments control room has played a large part in turning around our payments performance by enabling better coordination and quicker resolution of issues. For those awaiting payments, the national loan scheme I established has provided much needed support to businesses. The President of the National Farmers Union of Scotland, uh, Convener, welcomed the loan scheme as going some considerable way to filling the gap in the rural economy. The facts show that 16,357 16, businesses uh, received over £145 million to provide cover for the 2015 payment scheme. A large number of these have now received substantive payment. Turning to 216 cap payments, my overriding concern is ensuring that rural businesses, our farmers and crofters, receive the 16 payments as soon as possible and we continue to support and grow the rural economy. 
as at 23rd of January this year, 13,172 businesses have been paid over £271 million in loans until the 216 payments are made. Following the successful delivery of the majority of 2016 loan payments, I decided to close the loan scheme to general applications on the 20th of January. A small number of top-up loans are continuing to be processed for businesses which have recently had a transfer of entitlements confirmed. Our loans team are working proactively with those businesses to ensure any additional support is processed promptly. Delivery confidence is improving and our attention is now firmly focused on meeting our commitment to complete the processing of, pillar of uh, 216 Pillar 1 payments by the end of June 2017, which is within the EU's prescribed payment period. I would like to draw the Committee's attention to a consequential factor around the recovery of loans, as I recognise this is an area of understandable interest by members of the Public Audit Committee. By recovering loans primarily through offsetting against the grant due, we have taken the decision initially to schedule recovery of such loans. Uh, this is necessary to recognise that expenditure on loans added risk to the Scottish Government's budget. In practice, there should be no material detriment to anyone, as all applications should be handled, with, handled within the overall payment window. Uh, turning to the software side of things, we have received assurances from our contractor, CGI, that the IT system functionality for 2016 will be delivered early in 2017. I met, convener, with Steve Thorne, a CGI UK president, on the 15th of December and on the 12th of January to make clear the seriousness of the situation. He has now personally overseen the introduction of key contingency steps to deliver the IT. I'm sure members will want to get more detail about this, which I won't go into now, uh, and Annabel Turpey will be able to do that. We are much clearer about the risks around delivery of new, T, new IT functionality and how these should be addressed. The more robust testing methods that have been introduced pre-launch means that the system is much more reliable and better meets the working practices of area offices and HQ staff, as well as our customers, at the first time of asking. My officials are continuing to work closely with the IT contractor and we are monitoring the situation. There is also a continued focus on delivery and support for farmers by our area offices and here in Edinburgh, and I am being kept fully in the picture. It's worth reminding ourselves why we are here uh, and why we decided to build bespoke software. We were responding to clear asks of the rural sector convener who clearly wanted three, not one, region. We also faced a significantly reformed, delayed and complex regulatory requirement regime from Europe. The business case to try and automate some of this was strong then and it remains strong now. A compliant CAP IT system will provide value for money. I'm seeing progress, but there remain significant program and technical risks, which I remain absolutely focused on. I'm seized of the ongoing challenges as we approach our key deadlines, but notwithstanding these challenges, I expect the program to deliver the necessary components for CAP compliance within its 178 million budget. The original decision to develop a bespoke IT system was sound. The cost of the futures program which has helped to deliver our online payment system, uh, represents around 4% of the 4.45 billion of CAP uh, funds due to be delivered to Scottish farm farmers under the new CAP regime by 2020. Because of the complexity of the new CAP, attempting to deliver it without a bespoke IT system would have resulted in significant EU penalties. Our benefits analysis demonstrates that developing a CAP compliance system uh, will avoid potentially £276 million of financial penalties up to 2021 and 2022. To deliver compliance within the budget, we have proactively improved quality and driven down costs by negotiating a number of improvements and changes to the contract with the main supplier Again, we're happy to answer questions about that if members so wish. Uh, on lessons learned, convener, there have been a number of interrelated factors which have led to issues we've experienced with CAP futures. 
we have implemented the recommendations of a number of audits and reviews to improve the situation. This is not characteristic of IT projects in the Scottish public sector. There are examples of good practice, including the Scottish Electronic Tax System, SETS, the Building and Planning Business Transformation Programme, and the Scottish Wide Area Network Sworn Public Services Programme. It's important to explain that we are applying lessons from other projects and lessons from CAP are being fed back into other public sector IT projects. The Scottish Government has recently introduced new assurances processes which provide a more robust and interventionist approach. On staff involvement, my officials are working hard, very hard indeed, to get the payments out. I'm in daily contact with my senior officials as we drive forward delivery of the CAP Futures programme and to ensure support is provided to rural businesses. And I've, I've visited many of the ARPID offices. Staff on the ground have a, a key role and their feedback is crucial. Uh, I will cut out some of this, convener, because I can see that, that you're becoming somewhat impatient, perhaps not unreasonably so, but there is really a lot of work that we're doing and I think it was reasonable to point some of that out. But just to come to a conclusion, I hope I have provided assurance convener that the work we are undertaking is having a positive impact, both on the completion of the 215 payments and on putting 216 payments on a better footing. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I don't think I'm becoming impatient. I notice that what, there's quite a lot of committee members who've got a lot of questions on this subject, and we're always grateful for your full answers, and, and I'd like to be able to get those on, on the specific questions. Um, just before we go into the, to, to it, I'd just like to clarify. <clears throat> I think Peter would like to make a declaration just of his farming interests, and uh, there was one or two others. So, Peter, would you like to just make that Absolutely. Quickly? Absolutely, I, I do declare a, 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 an interest in a farming business back home. Uh, Stuart? Uh, and I have a registered agricultural holding of three acres from which I derive no income. And I would like to declare an interest that I'm a partner in a farming partnership. Now, the first question is, is coming from Peter. Thank you, convener, and good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, sadly, we are still awaiting to... 2015 payments, and I, uh, you know, I thank you for the updated uh, the information that we've had. But uh, it's it's good to see that something like 99% of the the the, uh, the pillar one payments have been made. But there are still substantial monies outstanding in, in pillar two payments. Uh, the biggest one being Elfas monies, and th some 2,400 farmers still awaiting payments, and 17 and a half million pounds outstanding. This is now money that is it, it's seriously late, uh, and you know we, we, we need an explanation as to why this process has taken so long. Well, th thank you for, for, for that comment, and uh, I am uh, pleased that, that you recognise, particularly as a farmer, that the 99% performance figure is, is good, but it's not good enough, and I accept that. And the LFAS payments is perhaps the the most significant area where we've yet to complete the 215 figures. Let me just state the figures in the round, if I may, and then perhaps I can pass to officials to provide a little bit more detail, as this is extremely important to me. Um, first of all, the estimated number eligible for less favoured area support are 11,380. The number of payments, 7,532. The amount paid, 46.7 million. Percentage eligible paid, 79%. The number of businesses still to be paid, um, 2,408, making a total unpaid of 18.8 .8 million. Of that, uh, I understand that the substantial proportion of that convener has in effect already been paid by the loan system. And let me just explain that the, the LFAS claimants were entitled uh, to claim loans on their payments. The, the, on a risk assessment basis, that loan was assessed up to 100%. I think a broad rough average a, for the purposes of this discussion, um, and I appreciate an average is talking about a cohort and any individual case is, is, is very serious, but on average I think the, the loan amounted to around 80% of the total. So the point I'm making is that yes, they are not fully completed, but in the round, most of those entitled to LFAS will have received a loan and the average amount of that loan amounts to around about 80%. I'm just saying that not in any way to excuse the fact that we haven't completed the job, but to put it in context. 
And perhaps I could bring Annabel Turpey in um, in a moment. And, and I would say, and, and this is a, a case I know from speaking to Richard Lock, the case I know from speaking to Richard Lockhead, there is always there is always a tale, a convener of cases that are not paid within the the, the uh, recognised time limits. There always is a, in cap on both sides of the border. Unfortunately, and sadly, the tale is far more bushy this year than it was in previous years. Annabel. So just to add a bit more detail onto the figures, um, of the 2,408 payments that are still outstanding where people will receive payment, i.e. the loan is not the total of the money they'll receive, uh, Cabinet Secretary referred to 17.4 million. Of that, 13.6 million has been paid out in loans and will be recovered against the payment, which leaves £3.8 million still to go to farmers. You will complete this process. When, when, when are, are these all, all these payments going to be made fully? Okay. So the delay in payments is that is mainly relating to common grazing provision, and that is going to be addressed in the release, the next release of functionality, which we are looking at in uh, will be in place by the end of the first week of February. So I would expect payment after that. I want to be very. I would like to update the committee when we have more certainty about that date, because I know that it is not helpful if we give a date and then we do not keep to it. But I, if I can explain that that is what is holding up the the payments. And can I ask also, and the, the other the other significant part that's missing is LMO payments. That you seem to be struggling with them as well. What's the ex explanation for them being so? Uh, you know, we're at seventy odd percent of them only paid as well. So we are now at 77% and we have got 471 outstanding, which is at 0.5 million. Um, again, we are doing our utmost to process these and I believe that some of these are subject to the same, function, the same release of functionality. Um, I cannot give you precise figures about how many of those are being done, but we are steadily decreasing them. I can write and inform the committee in slower time if that would... Be appropriate. It's still the IT, the IT system still can't handle these cases. I mean, that, that's the problem. That's where we are. Um, the, the release of the, the next release of functionality will aid. Yes, that is correct. Okay. Right, uh, can I just ask two questions as a follow-up on that? Can, can you can you confirm to me that everyone regarding their 2015 payments have had an explanatory letter explaining exactly what the payments for? Because uh, I'm still hearing people that haven't got those. Could you explain to me where we are on that, please? So on letters, um, payment letters went out for BPS, um, Greening and young, young Farmer. The reductions and exclusions letter, which explains exactly what makes up that payment letter, has not gone out yet. Again, that is dependent on the release of functionality. And I am sorry to say that I think that will be... I do, I do not think it is, is realistic to say that that will be before the middle of March. I know that is deeply unacceptable, but that is what I believe. Again, I'm trying to be realistic about this and make sure that we are giving deadlines that we can keep to. I think the problem is, is that, that, that people are completing tax returns and they have no idea in some cases exactly where the money is coming from. And as far as budgeting into the future, because they don't know what has been added to, subtracted from, and where the payment is, where they're going to be in forthcoming years, which I think is, is deeply regrettable for, for people who are trying to run businesses. And I wondered if, if you would agree that, that these letters are becoming more and more vital in every day that passes till they arrive. I would absolutely agree. I think that letters... Letters is something that we've mentioned before and again was picked up in Papels and in the DG's appearance in, in September. Eleanor, did you want to come in? To add to that is that although clearly we're working, the effort is continuing, of course, to make sure that we can get letters out to people. And I understand the importance of everyone understanding not just the amounts of money that they've received, but also the reductions and exclusions so that they can come to a view in whether the, the payment is correct. And I do understand that. However, anyone who has... Um, uh, logged into the system, anyone who can access the system can go in, look online and they can see the amounts of money there. So the, for accounting purposes, for bank purposes, for tax purposes, they will be able to find out the exact amount of money. Anyone who is struggling to do that at any time can contact a local office and they will help them with that. Stuart, you want to... Um, I, d I just wanted, 
in relation to tax returns, which the convener raised, um, there is, of course, a box on your tax return uh, where you can say that some of the figures represent estimates rather than final figures. I just wondered if you'd had any indication from HMRC or otherwise uh, that they are alert to the particular issues that there might be in this area for people engaged in farming and are taking a, a responsible attitude to what might be uh, figures that are uh, estimates rather than final figures. Well, I'll have say, as I've said, the, the, the information is available to people who have logged onto the system. They can find out the actual amounts of money. The, the, the piece of information that is missing is the reductions and exclusions, and that will be contained within the letters that they're not going to get for some time. Just let me press you. I, I just want to know yes. that HMRC are not going to uh, be pursuing people who, who have a clearly demonstrated gap in the information they might be able to provide that relates to the exclusions to which you're referring. And, and of course, you're not responsible for HMRC, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. I would come back to the point that the amount of money that individuals have had is available for them to know. We, I have had no contact with HMRC. There's a small uh, follow-up, just if I may, Gail, and then I, I, I'm going to come to Richard, if I may. Um, I'll go along in a, a minute to talk about disallowance and, and EU penalties, but just on this particular aspect of sending out letters, does, um, does the fact that we haven't sent out letters, does that incur any EU penalties at all? No. Okay, thanks. Richard. Yeah, I don't think this question has ever been asked, so bear with me. Um, we've got quite a number of schemes, basic payments, greening, young farmer, beef and sheep scheme, rural priority scheme, Land managers, option scheme, less favourable area support scheme. Why, why do we have so many schemes? And who, who basically made us have all these schemes? That's, that's obviously a question. Cabinet Secretary. <laughs> uh, while he's just gathering his thoughts, I, I, will, I will slightly delay, or unless Annabelle wants to come in. I'm used at the question because I think it is, in a sense, a perfectly pertinent one. I mean, particularly perhaps for those who are not versed in, in all the acronyms and all the different schemes, it perhaps may look a bit perplexing to, to the outsider and sometimes is perplexing, I think, to many of the insiders. But, but let me try and answer that. I mean, plainly the purpose of these schemes are to provide su support, financial support, to our farmers, crofters and land managers. And that's, that's the purpose. Uh, and these schemes have uh, largely been influenced by EU policy. It used to be, of course, that, that the system was based upon production and that perhaps uh, gained unpopularity because of the food mountains. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the system was changed in, at the behest of the EU uh, in around about 2003, and countries, uh, member states rather, were given three options of, of ways in which they could introduce the new uh, land-based payment scheme. That has in turn led to, uh, I think, a proliferation of schemes and it's fair to say that these schemes have been devised by governments working with the representatives of the farming and crofting sectors, uh, notably the NFU, principally the NFUS in, in Scotland, obviously, and we work very closely with them and still do, and that's right and proper. Um, the situation at the moment is that we must allocate 4 million hectares worth of new payment entitlements around 400,000 fields in three payment regions for over 18,000 farmers. Each field, I understand, is on average the size of several football pitches, and each field needs to be mapped in a certain way a, with a, a number of compass points taken in order to establish the exact location of every single boundary. That work, a, which is required by the system, and it, it must be a digital system, a digitalized map is required, that system has proven to be immensely complex. With the benefit of hindsight, convener, perhaps all of those involved, in, including representatives of farmers and governments, uh, might have traded off a bit of complexity for simplicity of, in terms of administration. And it is a point in the future, and I, I don't know whether members have any appetite for looking at the future of, of uh, farm payments. I certainly do, because it seems to me that if the UK government's intentions are to come out of Europe in March 19, then there only are two more years of the CAP, and I have no idea what's going to 
replace the CAP, neither does Liz Truss, I noticed, in the statement she made recently, but, but it would be a pointer in the future to, uh, to recognise that I think there's perhaps a trade-off about avoiding having a system that is so complex to administer that we end up having to devise a system of IT, and Annabelle, I would like Annabelle, I hope she'll have a chance to explain exactly what we've been doing over the last weeks and what she has been leading in a very vigorous and determined fashion, I assure you, to implement one of the most complex IT systems that there perhaps exists. So I think you actually hit the nail on the head, Mr. Lyle, with, with the, the point that... We, numerous, numerous different... You know, at the end of the, end of the day, yes, the government has a part of the blame, but does the NFU also have a part of the blame because of the fact that they've prompted the government to do all these systems? Well, I'm not uh, interested in blame. I'm interested in responsibility. I, I've not... Uh, you know, I think it's a reasonable point for me to make without getting pious or anything. I think it's a fair statement of fact. I have not shirked the responsibility I have, nor, nor would I. I think I've, I have been quite open and transparent about that. In fact, I don't actually think, convener, that any minister has been subjected to so much scrutiny over an issue for so prolonged a period, and I don't object to that. That, that is your job. Fine. And I don't think that there's any cabinet secretary that's been more transparent about the issues facing him or gone into more detail about these issues, and rightly so. But I do think there is a responsibility for all of us who have a duty going forward to perhaps devise a different system to bear in mind that we must recognise that the issue of how that system is administered is almost as important as the content and the substance of the system itself. And I don't make that point in any way uh, as a plea in mitigation, but rather a pointer to the future because you know, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to, to think more and more about, you know, what are we going to do in future should Brexit go ahead, particularly a hard Brexit, and particularly March 2019. There's only two years left of CAP. You know, when are we going to start looking at that rather than, you know, I'm quite happy to go over all the man UTI. In fact, that there was more I wanted to say about the rural priorities payments just to put things in context, but... But maybe Cabinet you know. Secretary, sorry, I, I must ask you to stop there because we are, as a committee, going to be looking at uh, agriculture uh, post-2020 and we are proposing to do it. And I think that everyone welcomes uh, a thought process that makes it simpler by the very fact that the RPIB budget has gone up from 34 million in 2014-15 to 62 million in 17-18 indicates that we haven't got a simpler system and therefore we'll do it in, it, we will need to look at it in the future. And I absolutely, sorry, if I can finish, I absolutely believe the committee has an appetite for looking at that. And, and I thank Richard for his, his question <clears throat> and would like to move on, if I may, Cabinet Secretary, to, to Gail Ross, who has, a, who, who has a question on a slightly different subject. Thank you, Convener. I think that, Cabinet Secretary, this is probably the one that um, certainly being involved in both committees, the Public Audit and this committee, um, that we have scrutinised most, and quite rightly so, and, and we do thank you for um, your transparency and that of the, the government. Um, I wanted to go back to the disallowance for, for the late uh, 2015 payments. And uh, Eleanor Mitchell, you remember that you told the Public Audit Committee that uh, when asked about disallowance for late payments, that the worst case scenario estimate was uh, about five million euros. Can you maybe just explain to this committee if that estimate related to late payments for just pillar one, or if it was pillar one and pillar two, and if it was just for pillar one, do we have any estimates for pillar two? Um, we are only, we only um, are penalised in relation to Pillar 1 payments. So the estimate of up to 5 million euros uh, is only in relation to Pillar 1 payments. And that estimate hasn't changed because we are still in regular contact with other parts of uh, the UK, or the other real payment agencies, to uh, finalise all the figures. OK. Um, have you made <coughs> any other estimates of uh, potential disallowance for any other infringement of EU cap rules? And just for information-wise, how are other parts of the UK getting on with their administration? So on the first part, in terms of other disallowances, we, it would be premature for us to do so at the moment. We are in the process of the audits. Have just, the audit processes have just started. We, had, we have had two... Um, European audits so far, we've got others planned. We've got Euro um, European Court of Auditors audits starting. Um, so 
until there's a process of negotiation that goes on between these kind of audit processes. We're informed of findings, we negotiate, we discuss with them, we come to an agreement. So until we are clearer about what they have found, we, we, we wouldn't make an estimate of, um, of disallowance in relation to anything they have come up with. And other parts of the UK? Parts of the UK, um, for the reasons um, the Cabinet Secretary has outlined, um, Scotland finds itself in a, a more complex situation in terms of what the system we are trying to process and the payments we are trying to make. So it's fair to say um, that the Scotland is, has found it difficult to make payments for CAP 2015. However, um, we are not the only part of the UK who uh, benefited from the extension of the, the penalty-free period. And the, none of the none of the parts of the UK have actually finalised the numbers yet. So we're still, still working on, on, on agreeing a position. And do we have a time scale for these European audits? We do. We have a schedule of audits. We do, which we can share. That as, a, as a question, but if you, if you want to ask it very briefly, um, uh, Eleanor, I'm very happy if you want to ask that briefly on the time scale. Yes, certainly. So the, the first uh, BEEF 2016 audit was in, is in April. It completed in June. There was a desk audit on the National Reserve um, also in June. Um, and the next one we're expecting is on land-based measures starting in October. And in relation to the European Court of Auditor audits, we had the first audit um, on, called the DAS audit in November. Um, sorry, in, that was in relation to 2015. The 2016 was in June. Um, and the introduction of BPS was in October, and we're expecting the next one in March on greening. Okay. Uh, the next question is on errors and overpayments. Peter. So we've just seen, we got a paper through late last night since and you identified that since the last committee appearance, there's been a further there have been further errors in, pay, in making payments, and we see there's another 15 duplicate payment errors have been identified with a total value of £490,000. Like, you know, and it just seems to be there's a, there's a never-ending shocking catalogue catalog of errors in making these payments. And, and I just make the comment that this standard of operation is, you know, it's totally unsatisfactory. Something must be seriously wrong here. You say that it's a, it, it's, it's just a, a, a staffing issue, that uh, a human error issue, but surely to goodness we need to get this, uh, this right. And to, to be paying double payments ag again, another, another issue here with 15 people paid double, double amounts of money, and you've got to ask this for this money back. Totally unsatisfactory situation. Something just sorry, I, I, it came out in Peter's question. That th those are duplicate errors that are separate to the ones that we got disclosed on the 24th of November. So is that right? Is that it is? So those are a different set of errors. Sorry, who's uh, who's uh, uh, I, uh, can uh, I pick Ellen? up that that, qu sorry. that question? So the, yes, there's a, the, these are new errors that were discovered. For Fifteen businesses. Um, the. As I, I've out, I outlined um, um, at, at the Papal's Committee, some of the measures we'd put in place in order to try and get to the bottom of these um, error payments. And I should say, I would say in relation to this, th this error was actually made um, quite some time ago, but it's only recently been discovered. What's unique about this um, payment and why it wasn't found out by some of the checks we'd done before was in relation to the payments being made in euros rather than sterling. So when we make a payment in euros, we, put it, we have to extract information from the locally held system, bank details, and then we make the payment through the Scottish Government normal processing system. So in relation to those, those 15 businesses, the first time we tried to make those payments on the 24th of October, there was no European bank detail information. We therefore went into the system, added it back in, um, and the payments were subsequently made on the 23rd of November. Unfortunately, although um, we were um, emailed to be informed that these payments had been made, we didn't use that information to update our master spreadsheet, which we held, held locally. So the payments were made again at the next payment run on the 23rd of December. So it, again, it was another, it was another human error. Um, it, was, um, it was made within the loans team. However, the, 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 the difference was it was a euro payment rather than a sterling payment. So the changes we'd made up to then hadn't picked that up. Since then, we have, we have made some changes to our processing to make sure that this error yet again, that kind of error doesn't happen again. We've taken all end-to-end -end processing for all Euro payments back into the one team, where a shared mailbox is used 
therefore the, the point of a single being reliant on a single member of staff to act, make an action has been taken away. We've introduced a checklist approach to payment processing in advance of all payments. And of course, we are we're continuing to implement the recommendations from the previous internal audit work that has been done in, on various teams on the use of spreadsheets. And of course, there is a training exercise in place on the use of spreadsheets that all staff who are involved in them are going through. Could I just add, Convener, just a couple of general points that, um, you know, it is in the nature of the, of the human species that we are fallible. And in terms of managing a group of people who are doing their best, to get payments out to farmers, we should remember a number of things. One, the people in the RPID offices are absolutely determined to get these payments out. Number two, we've talked about the audit system. No payment can be made under the EU rules until it has been fully checked and validated. The penalties for making errors are substantial. The, the consequences for farmers of making an errors and are disproportionate in terms of the burdens. That's probably common ground. Uh, I know that some of the staff who made errors felt absolutely hellish about it. Now, there's two things I can do. Either I can beat them around the head, in which case they'll just be demoralized and feel worse. Or I can say, as I did, you did a great job in getting the loan scheme out. And the big picture is they got the loan scheme out at a time where the payment was received earlier than ever before. Uh, at a time when I understand, and I'm not a farmer, but understand many farmers do the financial planning uh, just before the year end in the dark nights when there's not much that can be, so much that can be done perhaps in the farm. And therefore, that was a calculated decision. Uh, and the staff, the point here is the staff bust a gut to get that loan scheme out to around 13,000 people, 272 million pounds. And I think, yes, errors are made. We'll always make errors. Errors were made in previous years, and my goodness me, Read chapter 12 of the book, Our Blunders of Governments, called Farmer's Fleece, to read about the errors were made in our counterparts down south. So I'm afraid that we will never see an avoidance of errors, but the best way to get the job done is to encourage and thank the staff, not an endless repetition of blame, uh, blame ascription and going over and over errors, which are very quickly, a, a, or in most cases, corrected and sorted out in, in all cases, as I think you would agree from Eleanor. So that's the approach I take. It's up to, to each of us to decide how we conduct ourselves and how we seek to proceed. But, but you know, spare a thought for the staff who are doing their best under huge pressure to get the job done well. Uh, I thank them for that. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that? And can I just uh, actually make a, an, an observation and, and where we, we share common ground is that the penalties that farmers have to face if they make a mistake are disproportionate. And, and farmers find it very difficult, and I know from filling in forms how difficult it is sometimes not to make a mistake. You double check it. And, and therefore, it's always nice to hear that the Cabinet Secretary is aware of that and will bear that in mind. Uh, when, when he sees the mistakes from the department. Can I just ask the five million euros that uh, we've heard from Eleanor may be um, asked for um, by the European Union. Where is that allowed for in the budget and what contingency for the payments that has been made? Two things I would say in that. One is there is a there is a one to two percent disallowance every year, and provision is made within Scottish government accounts for that. In relation to the potential risk of five million euros this year, I, I can't tell you specifically where in the accounts it, where that provision is made, but I can I can write to the committee on that point. It would be certainly helpful just it, it, having just uh, looking looking at the budget to know where that that five million will, will euros will be put, Stuart. Technical accounting question related to that. Are you treating it as a liability or a contingent liability? Because, of course, if it's the former, you have to make financial cover. If it's the latter, you don't. I will include that point in the update I provide to the committee. Okay, the, the, the next question, if we may move on, is, is to do uh, with the CAP Futures programme. And I noticed Annabelle wanted to come in on this, so this may be your moment. The question... Yes, sorry, Cabinet Secretary. I, mean, I should have perhaps signalled earlier, but um, just, just to, I mean, you know, Eleanor's all over this case. She's talked about penalty of five million. That's five million too many. But just, just let's recap a little bit about what it looked like when this report from Audit Scotland uh, was published, the Auditor General's report, and it was published the day, actually, I, I, uh, I 
it was appointed, so I kind of, uh, it, it certainly concentrated the mind, I can assure you. And the auditor said, a range of financial penalties is possible with a potential range between £40 million and £125 million. So we were looking then uh, over the edge of a cliff, quite frankly, because that sort of penalty is hugely substantial and would have been devastating in a financial sense. So, you know, it's, it's not that we are proud of the, the fact that there is a five, five million fine, but that's uh, facing a five, five million penalty, that's not good, but it's certainly a far, a far improved position than the position that we faced on the day when I took this job. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So, if I may move on to the, the CAP futures question. Uh, in, May, in May 2016, Aud Audit Scotland said that the total cost of the CAP futures programme would be £178 million. And just so I've got this right, I believe that's risen from £102 million in 2012, uh, £128 million in 2014, uh, to £178 million in 2015. Interestingly, I note also that we've been told that Audit Scotland in their May briefing said that Audit Scotland do not believe the programme will ever deliver value for money. So, uh, if the programme is going to be about £178 million, including £51.6 million of projected costs in 2016, the draft budget for 2017 includes 42.2 million for cap compliance improvements. Could you explain to me what that 42.2 million actually is for? Or the committee, so, sorry. Yes, I'll, I'll hand over to Eddie on this particular point, but um, I, I, I just want to say to the committee that the, the, so the cap futures programme will close as planned on the 31st of March 2017 and the funding for that programme will, will be £178 million. Because of the difference in the financial years and the work that's been done, we were going to take some of the work, some of the money from the £178 into next year, but the overall cost of the programme will be fixed at £178 million. In terms of the, the, what the £42.2 million and other estimates in there will provide, I'll hand over to Eddie to pick up on the detail of that. Yeah, so... I guess just to set the context of this, it, you know, it, it, the, the, the initial build uh, in, in 2015 created the platform, created the, the, the foundation which uh, gave us a, 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 a cap compliant uh, system and one that would minimise uh, uh, the risk of, of disallowance and, and, and penalty. So I think you're all familiar with that. We created what we'd call the... the we, we termed it the, the, you know, the minimal viable product. So that, that was the foundation. There were certain things that had to be set up uh, there. And this year, uh, we, we've added new functionality, functionality to that within you know, that 178 uh, uh, total that we, we, we spoke about. There are three features of that uh, that were in that design that we're carrying over into the next year. That, that's the accounting uh, uh, element of it. Uh, uh, it's the uh, land uh, parcel information system element of it and, and a, a claims to payment uh, functionality uh, in that as well. So that amounts to uh, roughly about 6.7 million, we estimate. So that was 6.7 million that was in our budget this year that in effect we need in next year's budget. So that, that, that's the, the, the first uh, call uh, on, on, on that uh, element. Uh, so of the remainder, about 23.5 million is for further IT uh, development, uh, which is about maintaining the, the, the solution that we've, we've got. So we, we haven't just built something, we've got something that we need to, to, to maintain. And we still have to add functionality to that, for example, uh, uh, any amendments we need to do for, for the SAF 2017 uh, uh, processes. Um, we, we've uh, uh, identified the types of uh, um, amendment that we, we require, and hence what we have is a, 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 an estimate of, of, of the value of that to add that functionality throughout the year. And then what we have uh, from uh, left in that, the, the 12 million in effect, is, is, is around the transition uh, of the, the futures programme back into the, the, you know, the core business, particularly of the, the, the area that I now uh, uh, manage. And, and uh, we have a number of legacy IT systems that, that are still there, that are costly, that run in a different environment from 
what we've invested in in the Futures Programme, and it's my plan and the, the directorate's plan to move these over so that we don't have two uh, environments that we have to maintain. Uh, uh, Annabel, did you, did you want to come in at that stage? Or? Yes, there's also a, um, a certain amount of money, which is we are planning to fund the transition of the CAP Futures Programme back to the Scottish Government, and that will be across both Information Services Division and ARPID. Um, and also it will fund a mixture of temporary and permanent staff. So these will be the staff who, sort of referencing back to what the Cabinet Secretary was saying at the beginning, will be undertaking land review visits, digitising maps, so quite intense technical work that needs to happen. Okay. Peter, do you so, want so to... So it is a mixture of, of, of uh, uh, IT and it's a mixture of uh, um, you know, new uh, uh, duties, in effect, that the... the, the, uh, the, the the area office staff will have to undertake. Yeah. Yeah. Peter, you wanted to follow up on, on, on the uh, futures programme, I think. No, I, I mean, I think we've had a, had a fair answer on that one. Um, yep. So, can I, can I just clarify? I'm sorry, after all that lengthy thing, is, is, is uh, Audit Scotland wrong when they say it's not going to give value for money, or it is going to give value for money? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm unclear who I should be believing. I think the, Sorry, public. Uh, my understanding was the Audit Scotland report, I don't have it in front of me today, talked about um, a cap, the system would deliver cap compliance. And cap compliance being the, the avoidance of penalties to a greater or lesser degree than we would normally seek to do. I believe um, the £178 million will deliver us a, a system that allows us to avoid penalties um, to a greater or lesser extent than we have in every other year. So in May 2017, when they report again, they'll say it is good value for money? I think they would, they, I would hope that they would report that it, the £178 million has invest, we have invested. It gives us a system which allows us to process cap payments in a way which maximises our opportunity to avoid penalties. So it is good value for money? So it allows us to avoid penalties, which, as the Cabinet Secretary said, would have been catastrophic. Uh, OK. Um, Mike, I think you've got the next question. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to focus on the loan scheme um, and some very helpful information that's been provided to us last night, but I'm more concerned with the information that hasn't been provi provided, so I want to drill down on, on some of this, please. Um, in 2015, 455 million was given out to our farm businesses throughout Scotland in support. Um, but the loan scheme for 2016 has only given out 271 million. So from my figures, I've had to work this out, there are 184 million pounds, if it's the same level from the previous year, 184 million pounds, that has not gone into our rural economy. It just isn't, hasn't gone there. Uh, and I wondered whether you confirm whether that is correct. At the same time, the second part of that question really is, uh, you said loan payments were made to 13,172 farmers. Uh, but I believe, again, we're not given the figures, but it's something like 18,000 farm businesses there are, and therefore, what I, I need to find out, and I'm sure the committee would benefit from this, are we saying, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I know this, that over 25% of farm businesses have neither received any uh, payment or any loan payment, so a quarter of our farm businesses have received nothing. So those are the two elements I'd like some clarity on, please. Passing for the details, Annabelle. I mean, I think Mr. Rumbles makes a perfectly reasonable point, and you know, we're, we we will provide all the all the data if we haven't already done so. Uh, mm -hmm. Then we will happily supplement whatever data we require to make sure the committee is, has all the facts. There's no doubt about that. I mean, can I just say, in principle, that you know, the the desire in the the loan scheme for which I've been responsible, which I've already talked about in detail, and I won't repeat the previous comments, was to to urge all farmers to take advantage of the national payment. Uh, and we took reasonable steps to do so through publication of that in the general and specialist press. And I, I think that there was a fairly widespread awareness of that within the farming community. And we didn't stop there. We didn't just do it once, we did it several times. Our aim was that, that anyone who wanted to take the payment could. We also explained that although it's described alone, perhaps it also describes a national payment, there is no interest except in, in the very unusual event where there is an overpayment uh, in total 
after the claim has been assessed, and then there needs to be a recoupment, and then that recoupment is not paid within the allocated time. So we, we took some time to, to encourage the take-up of loans, to reiterate that and reiterate that, and I think that, that was broadly communicated effectively. Um, uh, but we found out, as Mr. Rumble says, that I think, broadly speaking, about 13,000 of about 19, 18, 19,000 entitled took up the loan. So we didn't just stop there, and this is new information, I think, to the committee, because I, I don't think I've uh, been at the committee since this occurred. You know, I myself asked the very same question uh, quite early on. You know, how's it going? How many loans? How many? Uh, what, what is the take-up rate? And it was lower than, than I thought it might be. And we therefore asked the, the uh, senior officials to do a survey, an analysis, a phone round, and I'll ask Annabelle can give a bit more detail. But the, the result of that survey was that, that many, many farmers, for a variety of different reasons, and Annabelle will give more details, decided that they didn't want to take up the loan. It could have been that you know, they didn't, the financial circumstances didn't, didn't require it, but they chose not to do so. Now, you know, that may seem to be a strange decision, but, it, but on the other hand, it's entirely up to each individual whether or not they avail themselves of a scheme that's available, uh, that's, uh, that the government uh, provides. But, but, you know, that, I think, is substantially the kind of common sense explanation, but I know that more detail requires to be given. So um, I think, Annabelle, you can provide that, can yeah, you Yeah, so on your first point, this was a national basic payment support scheme. So it wasn't looking at Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, it was just looking at Pillar 1, so you're correct. What we did was we looked at what the 2016 entitlements were likely to be, so we had, so that we knew that we were offering loans with the lowest level of risk to Scottish Government and therefore public money. Um, and we, as you will know, did the 80% in case there are changes and a cap of €150,000, which we felt was, was fair. Um, so... The latest figures we have are that all but 88 have been offered a loan, and the 88 who have not been offered a loan, that's because we're still working through transfer of, transfers of entitlement and they do not have a letter of comfort. We are prioritising these as a matter of case, so we will, of course, get in touch with them when we can make sure that we can pay, pay a loan. My question hasn't been addressed yet. I mean, the, the, my first part of the question was, I want to know whether this is correct... 455 million was put into the rural economy last year. And in the 2016 payments, you, you are saying 271 million has been put into the rural economy this year. For whatever reason, whether it's gone in or not, whether it's, you know, for reasons why it's gone in or hasn't gone in. I want that really trying to get at the facts. So 184 million, from what I've divided in these two figures. I'm asking really, is that correct that 184 million has not gone into the rural economy? Yes, because the loan that we paid yeah, is uh, not from the 455, yeah. it is from the Pillar 1 Yeah, I understand. I, just, I wanted to check that that yeah. was correct. My second part of the question was, uh, I'm drilling down on the figures, that's all I'm doing. Yeah. Um, am I right in saying on behalf of the committee that more than 25% of Scottish farm businesses have received nothing. In other words, no farm payment from their entitlements or the loan that has been offered to them. Is that, is that correct? Am I correct in making that assumption? That is right, that they have not taken up the offer of a loan, absolutely, with the exception of the 88, where we are working through to make sure that we can offer them a loan with appropriate levels of risk to the mm -hmm. Scottish Government. That is absolutely correct. Well, I mean, I just think... Personally, and if I make a comment from that, I think that's devastating for a rural economy on the basis that normally, and it has been the case normally, variations, but normally every, ever since devolution, this money has been paid out for December. I know there's a June backstop, but normally it goes out in December. So what we're considering as part of the remit of this committee, looking at the interests of the rural economy in Scotland, that there's a fantastic amount of money, £184 million, that has not been out there. I if I may come in, that, of course, that the um, Pillar 2 schemes were, to my understanding, never paid at that point in the cycle. So, yeah, so I, just, just, just as a clarification. The majority of the money has always been out there normally yes, in December. Yes, that's the 80% yeah. that we've okay, offered I've got those. I, th I thank you for your, for, for, for your comments. So my understanding is absolutely correct. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, brief, just to be techie point. Uh, I, I just want to be clear what are farms. Um, 
because I imagine not every farm is entitled to any payment. I believe, for example, there's a snail farm on one of the islands, uh, which I don't think receive, is likely to receive any subs. So when we talk about the number of farms, are we including farms that actually would not in any event be entitled to payments? So it's offered. just those who are entitled to payments. We've offered loans on the basis of the 2006. I'm talking in the generality yeah. of the numbers. When we talk about farms, we're talking about farms that would expect of to course. receive a payment of some kind. Yes. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. You've got a, a, a brief follow-up, I think. A very important part of the whole thing. You said that 88 farmers hadn't received the offer of a, of a loan because of a difficulties with transfers of entitlements. Now, transfers of entitlements have caused huge problems all the way through this scheme. And I, I'm, you know, this is one of the biggest issues that I get letters on on a regular basis. Transfers of entitlements seem to have been uh, one of the biggest problems. And I wonder where you are with that, that issue, because I still get lots of letters and folk at uh, 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 their wit's end because they, we kind of get transfers of entitlements done. Why is that proven so difficult? Um, I would like to write back on that in slower time, if okay. that is acceptable, because I don't want to give incorrect information. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, we're going to move to the 2016 uh, payments, and Braid has got a specific question on that, I think. Can I just ask um, a, a quick supplementary on the Yes, of course, before, a supplementary, before, before yeah. yeah. Um, the loan applications are closing. Um, in previous... Um, evidence, we had been told there was a deadline for getting your application into guarantee payment. Um, but now it seems to be that if you don't apply by, if you haven't applied by the 20th, you will get no loan. And you can't go back on that, even if your uh, payment becomes late or even later. And I thought there was always going to be a backstop that if you changed your mind, you could apply for the loan. Yeah. So um, we have taken the decision that we need to focus resources, as you can imagine, on processing 2016. Um, we have asked area offices to contact everybody who's spoken to us about, to, spoken to them about a loan, but has not taken one up, to to let them know that if they they should get in touch. And of course, and I think this has been in the um, you know sort of as in, as in the communications around the loan, we have said is if MD is experiencing hardship, they should of course get in touch with us about that. So to general applications. We feel that the September to January is actually quite a long time frame. We've worked hard with partners to make sure that the information is out there. But we are retaining that level of flexibility so that if there are people who have specifically questioned about loans, they are being contacted. And of course, we would urge MD who is experiencing hardship to get in touch if they have not already got a loan. OK, so if their payment is delayed indefinitely and they will then experience hardship, they can come back and make a case to access yeah. the loan programme into the future. Yes, they can. And, and uh, specifically those entitlement cases, I think for the reasons Mr Chapman identified, won't be penalised for the fact that they didn't have entitlement to apply for the loan by virtue of the fact that uh, they didn't have such entitlement at the date of the opening of the loan scheme at the beginning of November. So, uh, so that's why we've made that decision in respect of entitlement cases. So uh, each of those 88 cases uh, will be contacted to make sure that they are aware that because of the lateness in processing their, their, the, or determining their entitlement application through transfers, that they will be entitled to a loan. In other words, it would be wrong, I think, to have penalised them simply because of our lateness. I think that's a kind of principle that we applied. But we, we did, of course, urge everybody to apply for the loan back in October uh, and to do so at the beginning of November, to apply quickly get the money out, and the NFU, of course, worked pretty closely with us, and, and I, I, my understanding is that that, that that was something that they were satisfied with as making a positive difference in most cases. Right on. Can I ask if any of the payments due for 2016 have been made? I know loan payments have been made in lieu of them, but any of the proper payments have been made? No not started yet. Okay. And when would you think that those payments would start being made? Well, we're currently waiting on the latest. There is one final um, functionality drop um, we need to, to put in place, and we're currently working very closely with our contractors to um, 
make sure we're doing absolutely everything we can to get that in as quickly as we can. As the Cabinet Secretary said at the start, we're not going to promise dates that we can't uh, meet. Um, we are over schedule in terms of the, the predicted date of getting that release drop, and we're working with them on a daily basis to get the drop in as quickly as we can. And once that happens, how quickly will payments be made? Once we've got the drop of functionality, it'll be a matter of weeks and we will start making payments. Okay. Would, would it be helpful if, if uh, um, Annabelle Turpia or Mr Turnbull explained what this process involves? Because it is something that is uh, absolutely crucial and key. And if it would help the committee, some kind of explanation uh, from Annabelle perhaps and, uh, and Eddie might help the committee understand how we're dealing with uh, drop six. Yes, it would be very uh, helpful, Cameron. Well, I go first. Just if you but, so, can, uh, can I? Can I? I'm sorry. I'm conscious of, of, of time, so the, 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 a brief and succinct answer. Very absolutely, much appreciated. I, I, absolutely. The, the focus has been on improving the quality. I, I, I know that the, the, the system in the past has not been reliable. So our focus in, in, over the last few releases of the system has been absolutely on making sure that it works, if we can, first time. So that, 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 that's the, the, the point to note. So we have worked with the, the, uh, our partner, uh, CGI, the delivery uh, uh, technology delivery partner, to, to really get a detailed programme over the, 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 this phase that, that on a day-by-day -day basis we can track the number of errors or potential defects that are in the system that is being developed. So we're monitoring that on a day-by-day -day basis, which wasn't the case uh, prior to that. What we're also doing in this window is we're then looking at the nature of each of these faults and understanding how those impact on the payments. What, what particular payments will they impact on? How can we ensure that we fix those first if they, those have the, 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 you know, whatever priority be in terms of size of payment or, or, or whatever. So it, it's a joint uh, exercise here where we are really pushing the contractor to deliver. As uh, uh, Mr Ewing said, he, he has had a, 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 a number of meetings uh, with, with the, the, the senior uh, uh, UK lead in, in for the contractor to absolutely... Uh, emphasise the importance of meeting our, 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 our deadline uh, on this. And I won't go into the detail of the quality process that we've got, but happy to share that uh, with you uh, 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 in writing, if you so desire. Okay, Annabelle. Okay, so from the release of functionality in November, area offices have been processing, and processing very hard, the, two, the, the 2016 claims, looking at priority errors and data errors, so that we've got the right information in, that the, the, the staff has completed as much as it can be. Um, with the new functionality coming in in February, um, as per current timetable, they will then move on to the next stage of processing, which is, we've got the information, it's about assessing. There will be a number of claims that go through with in our, what we say, without touching the side, so they don't require any manual input whatsoever, and they will go to payment. They will go, they will go to a ready-to-pay status. Area office staff will pick up others. They are expert, truly expert, in, make, in assigning their staff, so the more experienced go to the more complicated, where there is more judgment. They will work with headquarters on all their technical regulatory questions that need to be addressed. Um, so they will be doing all that work planning, and we're doing that work planning, we're looking at that, on a weekly basis, we will be going down to a daily basis at the point when the technology comes in so that we make sure that area offices are completely supported in that, they're supporting each other and we're taking sensible scheduling decisions to allow as many claims to be processed as quickly as possible. Once, at the start of any SAF process, once we have the ready to pay pot, there is a period of about two and a half weeks when our finance colleagues have to do their checks to make sure that the right amount has been done. That's absolutely right. It is to, fit, to make sure that payments are compliant with all the regulation. So at the point, so to, to answer your question, at the point when drop six, drop six comes in, for those claims that go straight to payment, there will be a gap of about two and a half weeks because that's the necessary checks that finance have to do. So that is the, that is the order. But we're working extremely hard on making sure that we're very on top of work planning, that we are thinking about the tasks that have to be done and that we are making sure that we're monitoring because there's a lot of priority to get this work done. We're making sure that we're monitoring all the other work that should be done as well because the reality is staff are under pressure and that requires a lot of attention to make sure that we don't accidentally drop balls. Just to, to round that up, um, and it, it's just, um, you've, you've heard from, um, from Eddie and Annabelle on these points. 
I know it's not ideal to come in front of a committee at a time when we should be, we, were, we would be expecting to start making payments and, and not be able to give you a date. What gives me confidence um, in the process going forward is the is the daily, uh, weekly, and monthly regular schedule of both um, organisation and governance that we now have in place, which means that, for example, when Eddie was telling you about the the errors that are coming through the system. For the first time, that there is a there is a, an agreed process in place which triages the errors. It looks at them as being critical for payment or not critical for payment. The, the attention is absolutely focused on what needs to be done by the right people at the right time. Annabelle has daily meetings with the with staff and contractors to make sure that the, the absolute focus is on the critical path to delivery, so that we are turning all our attention to making sure that we can start making payments to the farming community as quickly as we possibly can. And I am confident that we are doing everything we can to get that as quickly as we can. Stop that bit there. And if I may go to Richard, um, you've got a question on, on technical stock take. Uh, thank you. Can you, you actually te technically answered some of the, the questions I'm going to ask. But December, one of the officials from the Scottish Government told the Public Audit post ledge Scrutiny Committee, we're undertaking reviews on the technical nature and the agricultural food Rural Communities Future Programme, and that process will start shortly. Then another official said, this is a technical stock take review to look at the IT system, as it is now in stress test under several headings for the gaps. What information can you give us about the technical stock take review you have commissioned, and will it see, what will it seek to achieve, and when will it report? Eddie Turnbull's handling this. Keep, keep this very brief and, and give you some assurance. I, I see this as a vitally important uh, piece of work. It's important for our, uh, the solution that we've got in place to, to meet the, the, the needs of, 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 of the rural community. It's important for me. Why? Because I'm now going to have ownership of that. You know, as the programme comes to an end, it is mine. So I want to make sure that what I am managing uh, is, is built and, and, and meets the need. So we, we, the, the process is underway. We have an independent contractor uh, 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 now in place. They, they have uh, uh, been given all the, 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 the technical documentation that they need. They've been given access to the system to look below the bonnet, if that's the way to put, to put and poke about in there and understand uh, uh, how, how, how it is, is built. They've undertaken a good number of interviews with, with key folk in the programme, technical folk within the programme. I should say the contractor has been very open in terms of letting the independent uh, reviewer uh, uh, come in. We will have a report, an initial report, by the end of January. So we're really talking next week. I'll have a, a, an initial view from that. And there's provision for a deeper dive uh, into any areas where we, we think there are fundamental flaws in, in, in what has been produced. So. Richard, Richard, would you like to follow that up? Or are you, are you happy no, with that? Basically, up? You're, right, you're going to have a report at the end of January. Will we get a copy of it? Or is that confidential? There will be some elements of it that, that, that will, will be uh, confidential because there will be some elements that will be commercial and there will be some elements that actually could compromise the security. So the report will be developed in a way that the key recommendations are absolutely shareable, but the detail of how we might have to fix it will, 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 will not be. I hope that's okay. Fixed it. Is it going to stay fixed? I think what I sh should, would come back, the, the first thing I would come back is understanding what we need to do to fix it, if, if we need to fix it. That, that I think, is the, 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 ne the next stage. And, and the, then, then we can see where that takes us. So everybody's money will be sailing out to them next, the, the next time they're due to get money? Well, I think I, what I would say in that is, I think, as Eddie highlighted earlier, so CAP 2015 was the, was the building of the base system. 16 has been adding on functionality to get to this point where we've got um, things to do. From 17 onwards, it will be more of a care and maintenance system. There'll still be annual updates we need to do every year. Undoubtedly, CAP 17, we will still be catching up in all the work that we're still been doing in 15 and 16. So my, my best estimate is, realistically, by CAP 18, we're probably in a better place in terms of running a, on a normal cycle. The other thing I would add to what Eddie's talked about in terms of the technical stock take review is we shouldn't forget that this isn't all just about an IT system. There is a huge amount of effort uh, that goes in, um, in in headquarters staff and area office staff to work with the farming community to make sure that um, they are ready and able to make 
do the processing of the payments at the right time. So in addition to the technical review, I um, commissioned a delivery internal review um, to make sure that we were doing absolutely everything we possibly could at the right time and the right sequence to give us the best chance of being able to act as, as soon as we got the IT in place. We, that came back with some recommendations, some good ideas for what we might do, and we're, Annabelle is taking that forward. I'm going to leave that there, if I may, because we still have some quite a few questions to go. I'm going to ask John uh, to, for the next question, please. Right. Thank you, Convener. Um, I mean, Audit got mentioned briefly before, so I just wanted to touch on that. If I'm understanding it correctly, Audit Scotland uh, are quite involved in the, the kind of detail, and then they report to the National Audit Office, who I think pull things together for the whole of the UK, if that's correct. Now, we did mention a uh, disallowance before, but my understanding is, you know, if Audit Scotland were not happy with um, aspects of what they saw, uh, then there are other issues like can the Scottish Government continue to be a paying agency, reimbursement of funds to the, uh, back to the EU, um, and, and so on. Uh, have we any concerns around that area? So you're, so you're correct. Uh, the, um, Audit Scotland is um, asked to, to do, provide some assurance to the National Audit Office and to others in relation to the auditing that's going on. Clearly, it wouldn't be right for me to report to uh, the committee about the ongoing discussions we have, we are having with Audit Scotland about um, recent audits and what they have found or what, what they haven't found. There is, a, there is a, a fairly lengthy process where the, they would present us with some initial findings, we would have a discussion with them, we would agree whether, whether what, what we think they have found is accurate and correct, and, and we haven't, we haven't finalised that process yet. It, it would be premature of me to comment whether or not they've found anything that, of, of, of concern or not. This happens quite quickly because they're reporting in mid-February, it was suggested. There is, that we, there, there is a deadline of the end of February. Because of the nature of the delays we experienced before, we've, act, we've written to the Commission and asked for a delegation on that, on that basis. We want to extend that deadline. We, we haven't heard back from them yet. We're waiting to hear. Right, so there'll be something new will happen, either the derogation or yes. uh, fairly soon, and you could report back to yes, the committee then. That's great. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Mike, did you want to follow that up? European audits, yeah. yeah. Um, well, we know the European Commission and the European Court of Auditors also examine the Scottish Government's performance directly, carrying out farm inspections, assessing distribution of funds such as LIDA. And the government have already stated that the most frequent issues under these audits are the over-declaration of land, areas of cross-compliance, ear tagging failures, etc. So my question really is, can you tell the committee about the direct European Commission audit process and the European Court of Auditors audit process for CAP in Scotland? And once you've enlightened us about that, have any irregularities been highlighted by these processes? As I mentioned before, we have had a number of audits uh, to date, both in terms of EU and in terms of the Euro uh, European Court of Auditors. Um, and we can share the schedule of the, of the audits with the committee if that would be helpful. It really is too early to say at this point whether or not there is any areas of concern that they've come up with. As I say, there is a, there is a process of where they would, they, would, um, they would write to us, they would give us an initial assessment of what they've found. We would um, have further meetings to discuss with them the nature of what, what has come up. As you can imagine, the, uh, as the Cabinet Secretary has already highlighted, the, this is a very complex set of regulations. Um, often the the individuals who come, particularly when it's a European audit, the individuals that come pick on individual cases. The regulations um, are open to um, a number of interpretations. So uh, in the past, there have been occasions where they've interpreted in a particular way and found, perhaps found fault in what we have done. After a discussion and um, further explanation of why we've implemented things in a different way, they have come to a different view. So I think it would be, um, it, it would be, it'd be premature at this stage for me to discuss whether or not um, the, what the findings of any particular order are because they are subject to discussion and further agreement. When will you be in a position to do that? Well, the, the, not for some time. Um, we wouldn't expect to have the first... Um, the, so, for example, on the beef audit, which took place in April 2016, we're having the bilateral on the, on the 9th of February. So that's coming up. But uh, after the bilateral, there'll, there'll be a further process of, of emailing between um, the, the two organisations to come to an agreement as to what the, the final position is. So these things take some time. It's fair to say uh, that the Audit Scotland report uh, 
uh, when it's available in May, looking back, will be something that the committee will, will need to look at quite carefully uh, to build a picture for the future. Um, Jamie, uh, I think there's a question, uh, and it builds on something that the Cabinet Secretary mentioned earlier. So, Jamie. Yeah, indeed it does. Um, I, I think, first of all, it's worth commenting, and no one else has said this, that whilst it's our job as the committee to hold the government to account, and indeed the Cabinet Secretary, um, I think we should acknowledge the hard work of the staff that's done in m many of the area and local offices that are getting these payments through. I think it, I wanted to put that on record and, and thank the staff for that work that they do. Uh, my question relates to previous comments on, I guess, the complexities of the subsidy system that we have in, in Scotland and indeed the UK, and indeed that relationship that it has with Europe. Um, and I hope the Cabinet Secretary will answer the question, with, the, uh, I guess, in the spirit in which I'm asking it, and that's that given that it's a very complex funding mechanism that involves the UK government, Scottish government, and at the moment the EU, what provisions or uh, thought is taking place within the Scottish government at the moment uh, in, uh, in terms of uh, a post-Brexit scenario in Scotland, in, in a sense that if we have the ability to reinvent a currently complex system, I would hope that the uh, that members of the, the Scottish government are having initial thoughts, at the very least, on what a future uh, payment system might look like, or indeed a future subsidy system might look like in Scotland. And that's not a uh, politically motivated question, it's a genuine, um, you know, uh, the opportunity for the Cabinet Secretary to share his views on it. Hey, well, it's a perfectly fair question, and I appreciate your remarks about the, the staff, and I'm sure all members of the committee would, uh, uh, would say the same, express the same sentiments. Um, we, we have carried out a great deal of work uh, looking uh, ahead to what may happen post-Brexit. Now, th this work is predicated with the caveat that no one is sure exactly what's going to happen, or, or, uh, and uh, I think that's a matter of fact. But we have held a variety of stakeholder sessions, for example, uh, myself and Ms Cunningham. Uh, I've held uh, numerous summits uh, on various aspects of the rural economy, as I think I've explained in the rural funding debate last, last week. Um, and just uh, last Monday, we held an event specifically on food and drink and agriculture and looking forward. And, and I think there's a mixture of apprehension uh, and, in, uh, and a sense of opportunity, sort of admingled, if you like, depending upon perhaps the, the views of the people to whom you speak. But there is a great deal of work that, that we've been doing in order to discuss with senior people, particularly in, in the industry, uh, and uh, I think there's an appetite for that discussion. So we've held a number of stakeholder sessions. Uh, I have met with Andrea Ledsom and George Eustace. We, of course, do, I think, and this was debated last week, convener, we do need clarity about the funding. Um, we need to devise uh, policies for what, what would happen post-Brexit, yes, uh, and we believe that I think we can do that better in Scotland. Um, and I hope that, that that will prove to be the case, whatever the outcome of Brexit is. But without reasonable clarity as to what the funding is, of course, it's impossible to come up with any scheme. There and end, um, you know, I do seek to engage positive UK ministers. I think I've made this point in the chamber. Um, and I had a meeting in this room, actually, with Andrea Ledson back in October, November, and it was fairly, fairly a, a cordial. Um, there was a clear agreement, convener, and I should say this, it's not meant to be political, but there was a clear agreement that Andrea Ledson, uh, myself, and my counterparts from the Welsh and Northern Irish administrations were to have met tomorrow. That agreement was fixed up to have that meeting. The agreement to have that meeting was fixed up several weeks ago, it was unilaterally cancelled, which we found, myself and Rosanna Cunningham, both of whom were due to travel to London tomorrow, really disappointing. Not least because we've prepared a paper uh, setting out details of the position in Scotland uh, with relevant information for our colleagues in DEFRA and in the other DA. So it was really disappointing. And frankly, not particularly respectful that a meeting between several supposedly being treated as equals was cancelled unilaterally by one. But nonetheless, you know, one puts these things aside, so we will go on and seek clarity about this. But I would just make, make this point that um, given that there are only, if Brexit goes ahead in 2019, in April 2019, we are only uh, just over two years away 
And what I gather is from the kind of hints and leaks that have come out from the Oxford conference earlier in the year, um, that there's to be a green paper. Well, a green paper is a high level document. If there is to be a plan for 2019-20 for that financial year, then the amount of time available to devise such a plan is very small indeed. And if one links that to the fact that, as was said by many members in the debate in forestry yesterday, it's an incredibly long-term industry, and that farmers themselves, as I understand it, uh, and Mr Chapman and, and Convener, you will know this better than me, but you have to plan not just one year ahead, but two years ahead, is that it's really not a political point. That we, we are already behind the curve in respect of working together with the UK government in a plan. And until there is clarity about replacing about the amount of uh, funding that's available. And obviously our, our task now, uh, since the motion that was passed by a substantial majority last week, our task is to seek a fair funding solution. I think that that was the terminology used in the resolution. You know, we, we really are uh, running out of time. And there's a related question, I think, which was perhaps what Mr. Green is asking for. You know, are we to use this IT system that's been devised at enormous expense? Well, it'd be pretty crazy not to. I mean, we've, we've got this IT system, we've got a digitized map, which of course is always being updated because boundaries are always being changed. But we've got this facility, um, but we don't know whether there is any plan to continue with basic payments, for example. What, what DEFRA want is the subject to a lot of speculation in the press, but hard information, which is what I can only go on as the cabinet secretary, uh, has not just been in short supply, there hasn't actually been any. So, you know, I'm very uh, uh, keen to answer the question, I think in the spirit in which it was intended, namely not a political partisan way, but just to make a plea to my colleague Andrea Ledsom, you know, please come to Scotland, please tell us what your plan is, please tell us whether the, the clear undertaking without a shadow of doubt that George Eustace made that the existing level of funding at two billion would be maintained, uh, and please share with us what your thoughts are about a good plan for rural Scotland and rural Britain. Uh, and we are ready to work with you. And let's, let's have that meeting which you cancelled last week and let's get round the table uh, with something on the table and discuss it in a constructive fashion. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Mike, I think you want to come in and that will be the last question before I have a question. I, I, I do, see. thank you for coming in. Uh, and the Minister referred to the motion in, the, in debate last week and I was very pleased that in my amendment the Minister accepted the amendment. In fact, every MSP from across the chamber voted for it at, at decision time, but the effect of my, and I know it's only a week, but the effect of my amendment was to, say, to suggest, and the Minister accepted it, that an expert group be set up to advise the Minister um, from all the stakeholders that are relevant to this process. Uh, and I was wondering if he could, I know, I know it's only a week, but I was wondering whether he has any idea when that might take place, when that might happen. Um, well, we, we have already appointed four um, rural champions, and I made that announcement, I think, last week. And these are all very well respected senior figures ex having an expertise. So, you know, we, we are, we're already consulting and advising a group of people, but not in the specific form that, that we've agreed to do following a, our discussions, amicable discussions last week, followed, followed by our support of, of Mr. Rumble's amendment. Um, but I expect uh, fairly soon to revert to, uh, to, to uh, a, a make an announcement in respect of, of that. But we haven't put a time scale on it yet. But, you know, we, we have been, as I'm sure many members around, the, perhaps all members of uh, the Scottish Parliament here have been doing, we have been in almost continuous discussions with, with leaders of each section in Quality Meet Scotland and uh, with Jim McLaren, you know, with Sybil and, and George in the, in the sheep sector uh, with leaders in the forestry sector in order to uh, work together to find a way forward, building on the tremendous success uh, in so many areas of farming and of rural life. And to build on that success is something that I'm sure we all wish to do. But whilst answering, if we possibly can, the questions about labor, about free movement of labor, the continued ability to have a workforce you know, in forestry, farming, food processing, fish processing, about access to the markets, which we've taken for granted, about the worry of tariffs, uh, which, which now uh, is an ever more increasing worry, if I may 
just leave it there. So, you know, all these things, I think, are, 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 are matters where until we get some more clarity, it's, it's pretty difficult, if not impossible, to come up with the plan that I'm sure all of us would wish to see. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, there are two questions outstanding that members have, have wanted to ask, but I, I'm mindful of the time and I'm mindful that we need to go on to fishery. Um, <clears throat> one of them uh, relates to uh, new entrants, and there's one from uh, Stuart that I'd like to submit in writing to the Cabinet Secretary post the meeting and ask that he would be able to respond to those as a, a, a matter of urgency. Before I ask him if there's anything that... <clears throat> Uh, he'd like to say in conclusion. I'd like to pick up on two comments that he's made, if I may. One is about the fact and the importance of planning, and the second one is about the importance of hard information. And in light of those two things which he considers important, and I know farmers considers important, can I ask if the 2017 payments will be made in December as they have been made in the past, i.e. December this year? Are you talking about next year's papers? I'm talking about the 2017 payments, the, of which the forms will be submitted this May, will be paid in December, as they have always been done in the past, except for the two uh, strange years that we've well, had. Well, you know, I can answer it this way. That, you know, the first task we, we are doing is to complete the 15 payments uh, and get the 16 payments on a proper footing. And I'm very conscious, convener, and, you know, I have to answer this question in, in my own way, uh, that many, many farmers have made it clear to me that what they found particularly irksome was that previously promises were made about when payments would be in their bank accounts, and those promises, in some cases, were not kept. I've, I couldn't count the number of farmers with whom I've had a general discussion who've made that point. And I think it's a point very well made. So I'm not going to over-promise and under-deliver. But what I can say, and I think what farmers want to hear from this, and with respect, I don't think I've made this absolutely clear, so I think it's important I do make it uh, clear, is that I am confident that this year, that this year we will see subs the substantial majority receiving their Pillar 1 payments within the allotted timescale as prescribed by the EU the allotted timescale, which expires on the 30th of June. Uh, and that is, the, that, that is something I wanted to make clear to the committee. And of course, as Eleanor, has, uh, as Eleanor Mitchell has clearly laid out, uh, in 2015, we had a number of problems. We have solved a number of these problems going forward. We've paid out 99.7% of Pillar 1 payments. Uh, uh, and therefore, I would expect that building on that success, it, the, 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 the performance in 2017 will be better. But there are various reasons in relation to inspections, and I'm happy to write to the committee about that, and other matters, uh, why the previous practice prior to the new CAP system being introduced is simply more, it's simply more complex now than it was before. But I'm very happy, convener, to, to write you on that, although I don't know if Eleanor would, Mitchell yeah. would want to add to that. If, uh, if Cabinet Secretary, before clarify. Eleanor comes in, can I just, uh, I, I've made a particular point, if I may, is, is, is not looking back at the past, because I think that you were given uh, a difficult situation to deal with, and, and, and I accept that, and I, I echo the comments that committee members have made about the hard-working frontline people who are trying to deliver for payments. What I'm specifically asking is whether we will go be in a position to go back to December 2017 for the payment that's due. The answer you've given is that it will be paid post uh, up and to the timescale of June. My problem is, is that I have absolutely seen in writing, I believe, that there will be no loan scheme for 2017. So what I'm trying to identify is whether farmers will have to make their own arrangements on the basis that they cannot guarantee in getting the money that, is, that would normally be paid in December 2017 till June. And that's my question. When will it come? What do farmers need to do? Well, no, I've, I'm not going to over-promise and under-deliver, uh, and under-deliver. So I, I've said that I'm confident that this year we will see the substantial majority receiving their Pillar 1 payment within the prescribed time, namely by 30th of June, and I expect improved performance, performance in the subsequent year. Uh, uh, and as to decisions, financial decisions taken about the 
the year after that, that is something that uh, I can certainly come back to you on if, uh, if you wish me to do so, and I'm happy to provide more detail about why, under the new system that we have, which was brought in by the CAP, uh, there are practical, practical problems preventing uh, the previous practice of payments being made in December month being replicated under the new system. I'm very happy to write to you on that because I don't want to provide an off-the-cuff or simple simplistic solution. I want to avoid that. <clears throat> I think that that's what farmers expect of you. But I will come back, uh, uh, if you wish, convener, with more detail on that because I appreciate the clock is against us here, although I think uh, Eleanor Mitchell is straining at the leash to add something which perhaps I've inadvertently omitted to mention. Not at all. It was just really to add clarity to the the complexity of the, the systems, the regulations we're working with, and also um, just reflect and the decisions that we're making around the, the regions. Um, that layered with um, the geography and topography of Scotland mean that the inspections that the staff are doing, um, the digitising of maps and the work they need to do on an annual basis in relation to inspections means that the work is, it would be incredibly difficult to, to get all the inspection work done by the end of a, by the end of the year, by the end of December for the SAFs 2017. And because, as the Cabinet Secretary said, the European regulations make very clear that all the checks that must be done before the payment is made, we would be in uh, danger of disallowance if we were to make payments in advance of that. And, and, and I thank you as well for that answer. And I'm assuming that because the CAP Futures programme uh, program will be delivered and working on time by that stage, that the extra staff that have been taken on to deal with the problems with that would have been put forward to inspections and therefore farmers could have hoped. But I, I will leave it at that and I will look forward to, to the Cabinet Secretary's answer on that. And Cabinet Secretary, is there anything you'd like to say briefly in, in closing before I close the meeting to, to allow us to readjust uh, your team for the fisheries section. Uh, no, I think I've covered it. Okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I'd like to suspend the meeting uh, while we reorganise for the next session.
Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth item on the uh, sorry, the third item on the agenda is the update from the Cabinet Secretary on his participation at recent EU Agriculture and Fisheries Councils. M Mr. Ewing is now joined by Alan Gibb, who's the Acting Deputy Director of Fisheries at the Scottish Gab uh, Government. Cabinet Secretary, would you like to make a brief opening statement? Um, Convener, every autumn the Government participates in a suite of international negotiations to agree fishing quotas for the Scottish fishing fleet in the coming year. Our negotiating approach continues to place key emphasis on behaving as a responsible fishing nation, respecting scientific advice and driving towards sustainable fishing levels for all stocks to protect this future resource for future generations. At the same time, we need to balance this with the socio-economic impacts and the risk of choke problems that would be created under the landing obligation by excessively sharp cuts in quota. This was the third December Council at which fishing opportunities were set under the rules of the reformed common fisheries policy, which aims to have all stocks fished at sustainable levels by 2020 at the latest. The overall package included at the December Council was very positive indeed. There are increases in the catching opportunities for 16 out of 23 key Scottish stocks, worth an extra £47 million pounds potentially to the industry in 2017. In the North Sea, notable outcomes included increases of 17% for cod, 17% for whiting, 53% for saith, 20% for monkfish, and 46% of prawns. Each of these hugely important to sectors of fishermen. Particular reference should be made to the outcomes for North Sea cod and whiting. Due to this government's direct involvement in the EU-Norway talks, we were able to turn around the difficult advice for these stocks into more reasonable outcomes that still fully respect the science and continues to move them forward to sustainable fishing levels, but provide a bit more time for the industry to adjust to the phasing of these stocks into the landing obligation in 2017. On the West Coast, important outcomes were SAITH 59% increases, HAKE 9%, Rockall Haddock 45% and a rollover for whiting. For the pelagic sector, there were increases for mackerel, 14%, 73% for blue whiting. At Atlanto, Scandian herring, 104%. Convener. Renewal of the EU Faro Agreement will continue to provide the Scottish whitefish fleet with important access to around 2 million of additional opportunities in Faroese waters. Thanks to the pressure from the Scottish Government, the level of Faroese access to EU waters to fish from mackerel was brought back to the negotiating table for the first time in three years. Alongside these stock specific outcomes, we have also made other significant political gains this year. At the EU level, we have secured a new flexibility arrangement that allows Scottish vessels to fish up to 10% of their quota for West of Scotland haddock in the North Sea. This uh, will reduce both operating costs and the risk of choke for the Scottish fleet. At home, we have for the first time secured agreement from the UK to top slice the UK Arctic cod quota purchased primarily with Scottish blue whiting in the quota swaps process at EU Norway to create a UK pool of swap currency to bring in additional North Sea quota where there are risks of choke under the landing obligation. This is an extremely welcome development. However, both we and the UK government still consider that a better balance could have been struck in the agreement with Norway, in particular with regard to securing, securing increased quota for the EU of important North Sea stocks. Alongside the international negotiations, I and my officials have held a series of meetings with industry representatives about the implications of Scotland possibly no longer being part of the common fisheries policy. We are working very closely and constructively together to ensure that we fully understand all the issues and what is required to get the best possible outcome for the fishing sector. I've also called on the UK government to give the fishing industry a guarantee that it will not trade away permanent access to UK waters as part of negotiations on exit from the EU. In conclusion, convener, it is clear that the autumn negotiations are a complex and unpredictable process with no certainty or guarantees. However, I was very pleased that uh, with my involvement and that of my officials, uh, and I may say that I don't think it's an exaggeration to state that our officials are highly respected across all the EU and very often are de facto 
taking the lead in these negotiations, that myself and my officials in this government have delivered the strongest possible package of outcomes for the industry in 2017. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary, the first question is from Murray Evans. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, and for the, uh, for the update on the meeting, that was essentially going to be my first question, where about the outcome? So I'm glad to hear that it was such a, a, a positive meeting and that um, so many positive gains were made. Um, but I would also like to ask, I mean, given that and given the information that you've just given us, do you think that that will have a big boost to the fishing industry in Scotland? And what do you think the impact in terms of employment will be? Um, well, I think the outcome was, was, uh, was a, a very good one. Uh, that, that the industry is mostly doing well, although of course it's hugely disparate, uh, but it's mostly doing well. Uh, when uh, Alan Gibb and I visited uh, in the week, uh, uh, beginning of the week before the fisheries negotiations, we visited the Peterhead market and we were told by workforce there that the amount of fish uh, at the market was the highest ever. Uh, just a straw in the wind, perhaps, but an indication that the industry is doing well. So to deliver 47 million of extra quota was a real tribute to the hard work which is done throughout the year by Alan and his uh, team in getting a tremendous result for Scotland. Uh, but at the same time, the problems of the landing obligation, particularly of the choke species, are uh, very serious and need a no doubt we, we will come on to that. But, uh, but uh, I, th I do think that the outcome of the negotiations was very good and, and uh, don't take it from me, one of the leaders of the fishing industry that was present uh, at the talks said after their conclusion, just after their conclusion, uh, that there, there isn't, uh, there isn't a, a better served industry uh, uh, than Scotland in any of the EU nations so far as working with the industry and representing their interests was concerned. So, so that was fairly positive. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, Peter. Yep, thanks, Convener. I, I would like to ask a question on the, the UK Concordat on Fisheries Management. You know, this is an agreement between the UK administrations. Now, there seems to be some conflict here. Uh, the... Uh, I just want to wonder where we are, what state is the concordat is at, given that there is consultation ongoing in, in England and there's none, there would appear to be no consultation going on in Scotland. And we hear that the, the English uh, fishermen are concerned that there's some 1,500 tonnes of English quota taken out of the Humberside area and, and given to, 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 to Scotland. I, I just I don't understand what's going on here. Can we, can we get some clarity on what the concordat is? This, this, uh, this uh, concordat, uh, convener, this is an agreement between the UK fisheries administrations. It's not legislation. It doesn't establish legal obligations, but it is a, a concordat. The members will be familiar with, uh, with, with them because there are, there, there are, there are various. Uh, the, the new cord concordat uh, provides for enhanced controls over transfers of fishing vessels between UK countries and for greater devolved control over shares of UK quota, and once these powers are established, but only once these powers have been established, the Scottish Government will put in place new rules that allow FQA units to move from a Scottish to non-Scottish licence only when a Scottish vessel moves to operate permanently in another part of the UK. Now, we did publish, actually, a consultation on uh, the uh, a quota allocation in 2014, and of course, the quota allocation is the substantial issue that falls to be determined af after and only after the concordat is finalised. Uh, uh, and a, we, uh, uh, we, we had effectively agreed the, the, con the concordat, the terms of the concordat, some considerable time ago. Uh, therefore, we did not think it was necessary for the UK government to enter into that consultation and we did not have a consultation because we didn't consider there was any purpose in doing so. It was something that had been agreed. However, its finalisation, I think it's fair to say, uh, was delayed by the UK government because of the fact that uh, the, there was the, the referendum and uh, the, uh, I, I think they may have referred also to the Scottish parliamentary elections. Um, after those, uh, those were over, uh, mid-year, we sought to have the matter finalised 
and it was then that the UK government said that they thought a consultation was necessary. It wasn't necessary. Uh, however, um, we are a, 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 a very keen to get on with making the announcing formally the uh, decisions uh, in relation to fixed quota allocation system because these are essential for further investment uh, in the industry. That's effectively one of the consequences of, of this. Um, perhaps Mr Gibb might want to add to that in relation to the 1,500 tonnes issue specifically. Um, and, and generally, anything else, Alan, that you want Yes, um, Cabinet Secretary has uh, been very comprehensive around the Concordat, just to say that um, this is a revision. So the first Concordat, um, the, none of the administrations actually consulted. This is a, a, new, a new choice by, by um, England and DEFRA officials, uh, Mr Eustace, to carry out a consultation. Um, that's fine. That's, that's within their gift. Um, that concludes um, at the end of February, and we'll take it from there. We don't expect any change. The, the concordance has been agreed at ministerial and official level, um, so we'll take that from there, and that allows greater control, and it allows the certainty that Cabinet Secretary needs um, over Scotland's quota shares. It would be unacceptable for the Cabinet Secretary to make a decision or make a recommendation or take forward a proposal around prote protecting and delivering economic growth for the Scottish fishing industry Therefore, for somebody else in the UK to undermine that decision, so he needs that certainty before going forward. That's primarily his purpose. Secondly, the, the issue of the 1,500 tonnes is a completely separate issue. Um, this relates from a an, an, uh, National Fishermen's Federation organisation um, news release just before Christmas. It just got picked up in, in January. Um, it demonstrates that they weren't particularly happy with some um, decisions uh, that came. Um, you know, I won't make any judgment on whether they should be happy or otherwise. But the 1,500 tonnes um, is a result of a top slice that the Cabinet Secretary indicated. Um, in our opinion, that results from a well-evidenced, um, extremely well-evidenced and logical case that that should not go to that one company. It should be kept cent centrally to appease and help with potential choke species under the landing obligation. That was the right thing to do and for Scotland to get some benefit. Why should Scotland get some benefit? In the EU-Norway negotiations, primarily, um, well, first and foremost, Scotland is the second largest contributor out of all member states, not the UK, Scotland, um, out of all member states to that agreement. Um, and the R2 COD that comes into the European Union is primarily purchased by um, blue whiting. For the UK, Scotland holds 99.3% of the entire blue whiting quota. So you could say Scottish blue whiting purchases R2 COD not one single kilogram of Arto cod goes to a Scottish fisherman. Every single fish goes down to England. That's why it was right that we tried to redress the balance, and that's what we did. And this was something that uh, was the subject of discussions between myself and George Eustace, I think on two or three occasions prior to the December negotiations. In other words, this was largely an infra-UK issue where the Scottish uh, fishermen involved felt that they had, frankly, um, a, a, had a, a very unfair deal where fish that they believe should have been able to be fished by Scottish fishermen were being uh, top sliced and applied uh, to a company in England. So I think it, you know, far from complaining about it, this actually was a success story for the Scottish industry. And I was very pleased, and I have to say this, and I want to be reasonable, uh, I was pleased that Mr Eustace did this deal uh, I worked with him very hard to, to try to get the deal for Scotland and eventually he was persuaded that it was the right thing to do. Uh, so, you know, I, I should state that for the record. But, you know, I can assure members that uh, <laughs> there aren't any fishermen complaining about this deal in Scotland. Just as a follow-up, I just wonder what species are involved in this 1,500 tonnes. Is, is that specified or is it just a tonnage of fish in general? How, how is it? No, it's 1,500 tonnes of Arctic cod. Um, what we'll do, we um, in Scotland, we don't, um, because it all went to this English company, we don't fish it. Um, so what we'll do alongside, in partnership with the UK, as Cabinet Secretary has um, suggested, you know, with the, the um, support of the UK Minister, what we'll do is we'll then look to swap that 1,500 tonnes with other European countries to try and bring in, uh, who do fish that uh, fishery, to bring in fish that will benefit Scotland and the wider UK fleets focused on choke species. So, for example, North Sea cod, haddock, saith, monkfish, perhaps, would be, would be target species. 
Fine, thank you. Next question is Rhoda. Um, it's been touched on, um, obviously, with um, previous statements, but um, the landing obligation and what progress is being made to to allow this to work properly and with reference to choke species and the like? Well, of course, the, the landing obligation is a policy that was uh, uh, brought in a, in order to tackle the, the problem, which I think um, most, if not, all of us found to be pretty repellent, which was the practice of discards of, of uh, uh, fish being thrown over the, dead fish being thrown over the side rather than landed and, and then used. I mean, I think, you know, that, that's perhaps one of the aspects of EU, um, or consequences of EU policy, which I think caused most uh, concern amongst the wider public, not just fishing communities, because it seemed everybody to be a waste. So the landing obligation is a well-intentioned policy designed to, to tackle that and to bring that to an end. And I think everybody, including fishermen, uh, support that. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, that the way in which it is implemented um, causes a, a, a risk of choke. And choke refers to, to, to those species which can prevent the full prosecution of quota for one species due to the risk of catching another species as quota has been exhausted. So if you run out of quota for haddock and cod and you're, you're fishing for other species, but you have a bycatch of haddock and cod, uh, then that can stop your prosecution of your main fishing effort. And of course, the consequences can be potentially catastrophic, uh, convener, because you know, if, if you can't go out and fish, then you know, you've got to tie up and cease operating. I mean, it's a bit like asking Marks and Spencers to shut their shop premises in February. It's, it's not much more complicated than that. And therefore, um, the, the, the issue about the landing obligation is the way in which it is sought to be implemented by the EU Commission. Now, I mean, there's lots of, lots of things I could say about it, but to cut to the chase, it seemed to me from attending the November Council and listening to the Commission's response to just about all the member states who took part in that particular Council of Ministers debate, and all who, uh, to a greater or less extent, expressed concern about the consequences of the implementation of choke species as planned. The, 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 the big problem is inflexibility and that the time period in which this is sought to be implemented is perhaps not practicable. Uh, and yet the Commission did not appear willing to extend the time scale. There's, there's much good work which has been going on, and uh, we've alluded to some of the work which we have done to try to address that already. Uh, the Arctic Cod uh, uh, deal, which has enabled uh, quota swaps to take place, will relieve pressure on some quota species uh, in the North Sea, which is, is good. Uh, allowing quota to be transferred between the West and the North is another method. Uh, de minimis exemptions are another method. Uh, carry forward of quota is another method. Uh, there are a plethora, I mean, I have other devices here or tools, policy tools, but I would say that the conclusion that I've kind of, kind of reached subject to, you know, this discussing with, with the industry is that the problem with the policy is it was just being introduced too quickly and too inflexibly. And the consequences of that lack of flexibility or speed could be extremely serious for, for those involved. However, um, the results and the outcome of the negotiations this year, I think, uh, uh, perhaps allayed some of the concerns that exist. But I know that, you know, the likes of Shetland fishermen, for example, were extremely exercised about, about this, as, as Tavish Scott has reminded us from time to time. Um, so I don't know if Mr. Gibb wants to, Alan, if you want to add anything to that. Just very briefly, I think the outcome of the, these negotiations um, just concluded um, help going forward. We have taken a transitional approach, avoiding what's, what's known as commonly known as the Big Bang, so everything coming in on day one in, in January 2019. Um, and, for example, a big increases in SAFE um, will be helpful as that comes under the landing obligation in the North Sea and potentially elsewhere. We'll, we'll see what the regional groups um, have to say on that and which Scotland as well as the UK has a, has a full seat um, on that groups that I attend. Um, I would just reiterate that there are probably answers to every single choke, potential choke species. 
um, and there aren't as many chokes as you would imagine. It's the inflexibility of the system and the timescales of the Cabinet Secretary saying some of the answers just simply are not particularly attractive. Um, and I won't say whether they're attractive to us or other member states. It could mean changing things that have been fixed in statute for several decades, such as relative stability. I don't think that can be done in a year or a few months, and that lies the, the challenge. I think the most important thing, um, significant development, was the reference the Cabinet Secretary made that member states um, and the UK and Scotland recognised that and actually raised the issue above the regional, the regional groups, which are dealt with by officials like myself to the uh, Council of Ministers arena where it properly can be discussed and the um, complexity is recognised, although the Commission seemed to take more note than, than anything other than that. I mean, that's a bit strange that, you know, in years past that it was fine to throw this over the side dead, um, but yet you can't land it without penalty. And I, it, it seems that you know, it's kind of cart before the horse. We should we should have had um, policies in place that would deal with, you know, people actually deliberately going and fishing those joke species, um, but to allow them to be landed and used. And it, it seems like everyone signed up to the policy, but the policy was taken in without actually looking at the implications of how you were going to implement it. Is there enough time and can you get more? Do you think there will be more time to allow the the policy initiatives that deal with those issues to be implemented before we, or are we in a place where we should be really worried about this? Um, that's, a, that's a fair comment, um, I have to say. Um, so I think this is a, um, a consequence of the co-decision process where you have the Council and the European Parliament working together. There was a very, very strong public demand to um, primarily deal with the, the waste issue and, and the food um, element as opposed to necessarily science, although obviously the, the two will go hand in hand. Um, as reflected to me by senior commission officials, this was viewed upon as, yes, we know we don't have the answer, but there is four years, surely we'll have the answer before it all comes in. Um, now, that has proven to be highly optimistic and unrealistic, but that was, that was the view taken at the time. Um, and I think it's now a, we're getting to the point where people are going to have to deflect. It won't be for me to suggest whether there should be a delay or whether the Commission or the European Parliament would, would condone anything or whether there should be some adjustments, but they will certainly have to deflect that the time available to deal with some horrendously complicated issues um, doesn't appear to have been enough. Uh, <clears throat> I think the final question is with Stuart. Thank you, Convener. Um, and let me just start by very much welcoming uh, the Cabinet Secretary's uh, remark in his opening statement that he's uh, seeking to make sure we don't trade away permanent access to UK waters uh, at the point where we leave the CFP. That's exactly uh, the commitment that we want to hear. Um, I may say, uh, Mr Gibb, of course, has just said in relation to some of this, uh, some things can't be done in a year or a few months, but uh, if the timetable the UK government has is we're 25 months away uh, from leaving uh, the CFP, so there is a certain degree of urgency. I want to um, just perhaps uh, pick on uh, that to that issue of uh, access uh, uh, there. Now, the uh, UK Prime Minister eight days ago uh, said our objective is for a proposed free trade agreement between Britain and the European Union. I don't think anybody in the Parliament is likely to object uh, to that as an objective. Uh, but she then went on and said, I don't believe the EU's leaders will seriously tell German exporters, French farmers, Spanish fishermen, etc., uh, that they want to make them poorer. And that's a, a very worrying indication, if not a confirmation, um, that uh, the interests of fishing in Spain seems to be on our uh, list of uh, things in which she's interested, but she said nothing about the interests uh, of fishing in the UK and in particular in, in Scotland. So my question, therefore, is uh, how are discussions on that issue uh, proceeding? Um, are we able to get the point across that uh, the fishermen in Scotland, and I suspect in the rest of the UK, um, are 
looking to the new fishing opportunities as a key way of underpinning the long-term future uh, of their industry. And therefore, it's vitally important what happens in the next 25 months, indeed rather early. Um, well, to, to answer what have I done, um, I have, of course, met with Andrew Ledsam and George Eustace, and George Eustace on many occasions, and I've said before, I have a good working relationship with Mr Eustace, whom I respect. Um, a clever individual, no doubt about that. Um, and I have specifically asked, uh, I think at every formal meeting, the, the question very simply, can you please give a guarantee uh, that in the course of the wider negotiations on Brexit, that you will not trade away rights to permanent access to Scotland and the UK's waters. Uh, I have not got an answer to that question yet. I, and um, I do think, as Mr Stevenson, who's long represented fishing, fishermen and, and fishing interests, I do think this is a question that will not go away. It's not a politician's question that is of only relevance to the chattering classes convener. This is something that our fishermen feel to their bones very strongly about. Our, our, our fishermen, most of whom will probably have voted for Brexit, see an enormous opportunity, a sea of opportunities, the phrase that Bertie, Bertie Armstrong uses. Uh, and they see that because they, they envisage that they will have the ability to, to, to fish for the fish in uh, our waters and in the UK waters. That's very simple. And if those fish are to be traded away on a permanent basis, then that will frankly be something that will cause a lot of anger because at the moment the assumption is that that will not happen. And the whole point of Brexit actually, as far as fishermen are concerned, I would think, is, is to be able to fish for all the fish, not just the relatively modest proportion that, that they fish uh, of the stocks in our water. So I have specifically asked Andrea Lensham and George Eustace on, a, on several occasions, answer there comes none. The answers that I do get are, well, there's, of course, there's always negotiations between member states. Yes, there are, but these are annual negotiations to do with quota swaps and fixing of TACs, as we've just described. These are not the permanent trading away of access. There's a very clear distinction between the two. And I'm not going to kind of um, launch into a political tirade about this. All I will say is this is a very serious issue. It will not go away. I will continue to press the question. And until we get an answer to the question, we can't actually go about the serious task of devising uh, a fisheries policy that would operate in these islands. So it's an answer that I, I'm, it's a question I'm pleased to, to have had the opportunity to, to answer. Uh, and I do hope that you know, perhaps one day a, a George Eustace may, a, I don't know, come to Scotland to, to a, have the opportunity himself to, a, to, a, to a answer the question using his words rather than, than mine. And uh, that would be a good thing. Are you suggesting that it would be useful to the general proposition of taking this forward, and probably in relation to agricultural issues as well, which we've been discussing in relation to uh, coming out of the Common Agricultural Policy, that uh, Andrea Ledson and or George Eustace uh, should appear in front of this committee to see if we uh, achieve success where thus far your, uh, your success is still being deferred? It's really for the committee to decide what it does and who it, who it asks. But I think in the interest of a, a good dialogue, and you know, I was being exhorted, I think, by some of your members of your party to get round the table with the UK government, and sadly the meeting with Andrea Ledson, which we planned weeks ago, was cancelled, at which we would have done that. I mean, equally, I can turn the point and say, well, you know, let, let's have a, a dialogue with parliamentarians as well. And I, I would be surprised if they wouldn't uh, relish the opportunity, but it is a matter, I think, for Parliament. It's not a matter for, for government as to who is invited to a committee, uh, as I'm sure you would agree. To that, I'm sure that I'm sure the committee will decide who who is appropriate and 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 will cast their net wide. Is there any 
final comment that you would like to make uh, on, on this before, before I close this item on the agenda? Um, well, I, I, I'm very pleased that we've had this. The first opportunity, I think, at length to, to discuss the interests of fishing. And there's, as members will know, it's a highly complex and really, really important topic. So I'd just like to say that I welcome the opportunity to have this initial discussion today. But I, I do hope that the committee, although it has many responsibilities and topics to cover, that it will come back to the importance of fishing because it's an it's a absolutely vital part of our rural economy and society and it's right that, that we will continue to give it uh, uh, a, a, a lot of attention and uh, discussion, particularly to, to come up with perhaps our, our own fisheries policy here. Cabinet Secretary, can I thank you for providing two updates this morning uh, to the committee and can I thank you, Alan, for attending the committee and, and giving the information that you did. And Cabinet Secretary, of course, you're right, we'll be looking at fisheries during the course of the year. Uh, but thank you for your time this morning. I'd li like to very briefly suspend the meeting to allow the Cabinet Secretary and, and Mr Gibb to depart. Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth item on the agenda is the consideration of the Seed Miscellaneous Amendment Scotland Regulations 2016. This instrument is subject to a negative procedure. The committee will now consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on these instruments. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. There have also been no representations to the committee on these instruments. Are there any comments that the committee would like to make? Is the committee therefore agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendation in regard to the, this instrument? That concludes this committee's business today. I would remind you, at the next meeting on the 1st of February, the committee expects to take evidence from the Minister of Transport and the Islands on rail services in Scotland. It also expects to hold its first evidence session on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan. I now close the meeting. I would ask committee members to stay present.